With Sony in need of a true mascot for the PlayStation to combat the likes of Nintendo's Mario and Sega's Sonic, Crash Bandicoot burst dick first onto the scene. Hey, plumber boy, mustache man, your worst nightmare has arrived. Promising to deliver lush, organic 3D environments filled with rewarding platforming and an overall gaming experience like none ever seen before. And to say that Naughty Dog's lovable orange no-neck f*** went on to become a monumental success would be an understatement. Things would only go up from here with the development of the rest of the trilogy as well as Crash Team Racing. After that, well, uh... Fast forward to 2017 because totally nothing happened at all with Crash between those 20 years. Crash is a perfect franchise that did nothing wrong! NOTHING! Although the original Crash obviously kickstarted what would go on to become one of the greatest platformers and one of the most iconic figures in gaming history, how well does the original experience hold up today? Well... The game kicks off with Crash waking up on a beach and you start playing. That's it. For some odd reason, in order to get the full story and find out where this walking Cheeto thumb came from, you have to wait on the home screen for a little while, and next thing you know, we're inside Dr. Neo Cortex's castle with his assistant Embryo, alleged author of the Bible, Sweet your Bible I wrote it. who are trying to mutate Crash with this vortex thingy in order to build up an army of mutated animals for world domination. Oh god, not those. I guess Cortex is a failure in more ways than one. Cortex machine broke, Crash escapes, and Tana the female bandit. is prepared for the Vortex instead, and we must rescue her. Does this sound familiar? It sounds familiar. From here, we venture forward with our jumping and spinning and hog humping to rescue Peach from Bow. <coughs> Sorry. The female bandit. From Cortex. The controls are very tight, satisfying, and responsive. Although sometimes when you jump and spin at the same time, you veer off and. When you're not busy dying, which trust me, you'll die a lot, you'll be breaking crates containing Wumpa Fruit, which every 100 of earns you another life. There's also crates which grant you another life, and crates with Aku Aku, a magic plank, and for every one of him you collect, you gain another level of invulnerability. If you collect him three times, you become completely invincible for a limited amount of time, allowing you to run rampant through all incoming enemies, run faster, and break all crates ahead of you, which is incredibly satisfying. Some good fucking platforming. If you can break every crate in a stage, you'll be rewarded with a gem. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Collect all the gems in the game, and you'll be able to escape with P... <coughs> the female bat. While also bypassing the final boss entirely by flying off into the night on an eagle. <laughs> anyway, sounds pretty good, right? No. Not only do you have to break every crate in these levels, you have to break every crate in these levels without dying once. <laughs> Which wouldn't be too terrible if the save system wasn't horrendous. Yes, you. Fuck you and your polygon tits. On second thought, I thought you were in another Many of the levels also have female bandit tokens in the crates. If you can manage to collect all three of these tokens in a single stage, you get to participate in a bonus round. Only if you can complete the bonus round or get a gem from the level can you save your progress. There's also two extra levels in the game that you need keys to access, and in order to obtain these keys, you have to find three Cortex icons in their respective levels and complete his bonuses. Which are much harder than the traditional bonus stages. There's also the embryo tokens you can grab in a few levels, and completing his bonuses can give you a bunch of extra lives. However, once again, these bonus stages are much more difficult than the traditional ones. Luckily, whether you pass or fail any of these bonuses has no bearing on whether or not you'll obtain a gem, so long as you don't die before reaching the end and, of course, smashing all the crates. But, as mentioned, if you don't want to go for these gems, you can use the bonuses as a method of saving. However, if you fail any of these bonuses, you cannot retry them immediately. You have to play through the entire level all over again. And some of these levels can be close to 10 minutes long. Not to mention there are some nasty difficulty spikes, with levels like the Lost City, Sunset Vista, and Slippery Climb being notoriously the whole system is clearly very flawed. Except this part because I am epic. Wanna know what's not epic though? The bosses. They're f***ing trash. All of them except the first are minions of Cortex, which is a very nice touch. 
As nice a detail as this is, however, this of course does not improve the quality of the fights themselves in any way. Papu Papu is Poo Poo. Ripper Roo takes some timing, but other than that, it's really not a challenge. Koala Kong is a hunk. Please stop it. That's not even funny. That's just fing wrong. In all seriousness, though, Koala Kong's fight is a sizable step up from the previous two bosses. It looks great. For the time, obviously. Music's great, and he's tricky, especially for the first couple times you ever play against him. He'll throw boulders at you and drop TNT from above before you spin a few boulders back at him to finish him off. <laughs> this battle got a lot easier easier for me when I realized you could just spin away the rocks he throws at you, but it's still pretty good all things considered. Pinstripe is unbelievably bad, especially for a boss as late in the game as he comes. On the flip side, Embryo is easily the best boss in the game, throwing potions at you, sending Gak after you which you have to jump on in order to damage him, and then roaring out at the end. <laughs> Here you have to jump from the bricks falling from the ceiling and bonk him in the noggin until he's down for the count. Cortex as the final boss is good, not great. Basically you have to avoid his charge blast which you will also have to deflect back at him. It can be a bit challenging but it's good I guess, it's fine. Up to this point I've done just about nothing but bash this game. So why is it that I love Crash Bandicoot so much? Well that's because when this game's not being absolutely infuriating or just plain boring, it is absolutely addicting. While the reward you get for obtaining all the gems isn't really worth it since Cortex is pace easy, a large majority of these levels are insanely fun to play. As promised, the stages you'll be progressing through are organic, lively, primitive, and realistic for the most part. In the beginning, you'll be traversing lush jungles, native fortresses, peaceful creeks, when they're not oh, eating you no alive, way. and hog riding. But as the game progresses, you navigate through ancient ruins, cryptic temples, roads to literally nothing, no. factories, laboratories, and more. This shift from natural surroundings to more industrialized and unlively environments as you close in on Cortex's castle is a subtle nod effectively showcasing what kind of effect Cortex has had on the world around him. Until Crash to Insanity when all his credibility gets sucked right out of him like a f***ing fart. The attention to detail is accompanied by a great score and even if as a whole there aren't that many memorable tracks, there are a few standouts and overall it absolutely gets the job done. So as much as Crash 1 may have aged considering Crash is stiffer than the floating board following him around, rampaging through enemies and crates when invincible, perfectly smashing all boxes over an open pit, running wild through the crates and the hog levels on your first try, and Crash's ba -da -ba! after finally acing that stage you've been stuck on for over half an hour never ever gets old. However, Crash's faulted save system, underwhelming bosses, and bullshit difficulty spikes prevent Crash 1 from being great and instead only very good. So would Crash Bandicoot 2 mix up the formula enough to help take the Crash franchise to the next level? Find out another time because we're reviewing Spyro 1 next. You got a problem with that pussy? Since Spyro the Dragon's debut on the PlayStation in 1998, he and Crash Bandicoot have always been tied at the hip like this monstrosity. Crash and Spyro in the late 1990s were like the PlayStation's unofficial mascots, always drawing comparisons from one another for being not just their brand's top two platformers, but arguably the two best platformers in their market entirely. So if I make a lot of comparisons between them during this video, now you know why. So our story begins in Artisans of the Dragon Realm, where two elder dragons are being interviewed to 
tell us about the dragon realm, I guess. And one of them starts some first grade level smack talking of Nasty Nork. With G's. The Nasty the Nork. <gasps> Nonetheless, Nasty Nork, or Ugly F*** <laughs> is our villain. The story here is simple, to put it nicely. Nasty Nork is a simple creature. Vampire. He has been contained in a remote world and is no threat to the Dragon Kingdom. No threat! Besides, he is ugly. <gasps> Spyro finds this mildly inconvenient. Looks like I've got some things to do. What a co Spyro being only slightly annoyed by the fact that his friends could be imprisoned in Crystal for the rest of eternity if he doesn't do anything about it is made hilariously more irritating by the fact that he sounds like he has a wooden clothespin over his nose whenever he talks. Afraid? Of what? I'll tell you what I'm afraid of, Spyro. I'm afraid you've come down with swine for it. Nonetheless, we're off on our adventure to collect gems and rescue our friend. Oh, Jesus, Spyro, stop doing donuts. This isn't a Walmart parking lot. Going from Crash's snappy turning on a whim in any direction you wish to this long loop is weird. Despite that turbulence. Get it? Because he's a dragon. <laughs> Spyro is a gem to play as. Spyro can jump, glide, charge, supercharge. Breathe fire and roll. Wait. Roll? Uh, yeah, roll apparently, because that's really fucking helpful in this game. Anyway, on we go into Stone Hill, and oh, that's cute. Spyro looks like a little dog ready to go into the tub. In all seriousness, the loading screens are actually pretty cool, considering how seamless they are, and definitely much more interesting than. This is basically how the game progresses from here. You travel through the six hub worlds of the Dragon Realm, hopping in and out from portal to portal, collecting treasure and rescuing our dragon friends. I think. I don't know, Spyro doesn't seem to care much. The levels are very vibrant, colorful, lively, and overall just a pleasure to run around and oh god, the egg thieves, I forgot to mention them. Okay, I haven't played Spyro in over a decade, but I still remember how terrible these little shits were to catch. Oh. Never mind. And that will become a recurring theme in Spyro the Dragon. While Crash 1 could ramp up pretty high in difficulty, Spyro for the most part is embarrassingly easy. The bosses are terrible. Literally worse than any of the Crash 1 bosses. As bad as guys like Papu Papu and Pinstripe were, at least they tried to hit me. Even ugly f the final boss of the game runs away from you, hardly even trying to hurt you. You turned 80 dragons into stone twice. Why are you terrified of what? Spyro 1 does have its challenging moments though, as some of the egg thieves can actually be pretty tricky to catch. I know a lot of people hate these guys because of that, but I actually find it kind of fun running around after them a couple times before figuring out their route and finally catching them. There's also these flying levels where you have to complete multiple objectives such as flying through gates, hoops, bashing treasure chests, and committing aerial homicide under an allotted time. These can be tricky and even a bit enraging. They're the only part of the game I actually had a bit of trouble with, and it works as a nice pace breaker considering how tedious it can be at times exploring the standard levels if you're aiming for 100% completion. Considering mainly what keeps the gameplay interesting is the combat. Some enemies can only be flamed, charged, and some are even totally invincible until Spyro gets a kiss and becomes HOLY! There's tons of other ways to approach enemies as the game progresses, but we don't have time to talk about that because we gotta get on with the gem collecting. And you'll need all the time you can get because some of these gems are very well hidden. Not to the extent that you'd find their hiding spots unfair though. In fact, you'd feel like an absolute brainiac when you find these hidden pathways. So you freed all the dragons, collected all the gems, and you've gotten all the eggs back. And the 100% reward you get for that is actually pretty cool, even though up to this point I'd seen enough gems for a lifetime. Ugly f**k's bonus loot level is very satisfying considering the insane amount of treasure you collect. And you get a cutscene after of dragons playing basketball with a sheep. Speaking of the dragons, each of the 80 dragons you rescue has unique lines recorded for them. Run! Run! Okay, a few of them repeat themselves. Thank you for releasing me. Thank you for releasing me. Thank you for releasing me. I've shit my back. But this is still all very impressive and oddly charming, even if they do say some very obvious stuff here and there. Here's a hint. Metal armor is fireproof, but a charge attack will take care of them. That's not even a hint, that's just a cheat sheet, you f***ing numbskull. And who could forget the most infamous line of all? 
Spyro. It's great to see you. But I've got to go. Go do what, Cletus? Yeah. Ten tier yeah. floor? Yeah. Suck my dragon dick! While Crash Bandicoot was going for a 3D experience, it was still mounted to a fixed camera. Whereas Spyro goes all the way with a camera you control in a free roaming environment which can help make the levels feel much more open and engaging. Creating the sense of going on a proper adventure rather than being on a fixed path. You're free to explore the worlds in whatever way you please and to play them in whatever order you want. Although good luck to you because some of these levels run slower than Gary snail games. Accompanying the levels is a pretty good soundtrack from the drummer of the police. I wouldn't say the soundtrack as a whole is as strong as Crash 1's, considering a lot of the tracks honestly just blend together and sound the same to me. Many of the tracks themselves are great, don't get me wrong, but they just get repetitive listening to in quick succession. In isolation, they're fantastic, and there's definitely a few bangers. When I started playing Spyro, I'll be honest, I was pretty put off by the iffy controls and the shitty bosses that gave me crash PTSD. But looking past all that, Spyro at its core is a fantastic, free-roaming, fire-breathing, world-hopping platformer that set the gaming world on fire, and rightfully so, only to have the ferocity of that fire quenched by questionable controls, a repetitive soundtrack, so many gems to collect that it honestly becomes a chore to 100%, and without a doubt, the worst bosses I have ever played against. On the bright side, of course, Spyro has loads and loads of untapped potential, so I'm excited to see what adjustments were made to take the sick boy to new heights. As Spyro said, I'd say the sky's the limit. Nerd! Speak. Fuck! Good boy. Crash Bandicoot's heart was in the right place with simple, rewarding gameplay and a beautiful soundtrack, but left much to be desired from its bosses, save methods, and difficulty curve. So how would Naughty Dog deliver a more satisfying experience one year later? Of Crash Bandicoot 2 picks up right where we left off, defeating Vortex after our previous adventure and sending him plummeting to the ruins below. Luckily for him, the doctor finds power crystals in these ruins. You'll find out why those are important shortly. After which we cut back to his space station where his new assistant, Engine, informs him that they don't have any allies left to carry out his evil plans. So they decide to trick Crash into following through with his evil schemes instead. And it's executed horribly. In the grand scheme of Crash Bandicoot games, story of course is not the focal point. It's the gameplay. However, this is impossible to just brush aside because here they try to have this manipulative storyline going on throughout the whole game when the actual motives are blatantly revealed immediately. Then Embryo suddenly appears and tries to tell you to gather the gems to destroy Cortex's space station because Cortex is trying to turn everyone on Earth into mindless slaves, which is absolutely true because you see him talking about the exact same thing with Rocket Dome over here. All you have to do is just put the first two cutscenes of the game out of existence. Now, it might be at least a little bit more believable that Cortex turned face. I mean, there's the obvious issue with the title too, but... Boom, call Crash 2, done. Plus Coco, you'll also find out who that is shortly, keeps hacking into Cortex's servers throughout the game trying to warn you not to help big fat groupie head over here. But Crash is just like, oh, well, what are you doing here? Anyway. Like I said, the gameplay, of course, is why you're here, and our boy Crash is back. He's back! Looking a bit thinner, you know, not like a brick. And with his girlfriend from the last game, Tonna- Uh, no. That's actually Coco. His sister. So what happened to Tonna? She ended up with P. 
Oh, that incompetent <laughs> you ungrateful piece of shit! You basically jump through the same hoops as last time. Break all the crates in a stage to get a gem. Well, almost every stage. But this time we have a new collectible we need to retrieve throughout each level in order to progress. The power crystals. And you better make sure you get them or else Cortex throws a hissy fit. The levels are laid out a bit differently than last time. In contrast to the linear one level to the next hopping from island to island structure of the last game, here we are introduced to warp rooms. These warp rooms act as hub areas where you can select one of five levels to play in whatever order you want. As well as select a level in these warp rooms you can actually save whenever you want. Thank fuck! As you know, the save systems last time were dependent on either completing a bonus round or getting a gem. Now bonuses can be accessed just by finding a platform with a question mark in the level, which will take you to a bonus stage that can be replayed as many times as you want. These bonus stages are a perfect place to practice some of Crash's new moves without repercussions, as his moveset also went under a bit of an overhaul. Now being able to crawl, belly flop, slide, slide jump, and if you're really talented, you can do this spinny slidey jump thingy, which is incredibly useful. New moves, of course, mean new ways to approach enemies. Some can only be bounced on belly flop, spun, some you can even hide underground from, and much more. And you'll have to be at the top of your game in order to unlock the brand new death roots. The death roots are much harder sections of the levels they're already contained in, and at the end of these roots you'll be rewarded with yet another gem. In order to collect the regular box gems, sometimes you'll need to be able to access these roots because some of them contain the boxes you need. I'm looking at you digging it, you maniacal f making me backtrack and shit. And you have to backtrack quite a few times in levels like Cold Hard Crash and Pissing It Away, and it is mentally exhausted just thinking about it. Oh my god. There's also five color gems you need to collect, some of which are obtained through secret pathways and time trials, or by cheating. And these gems will unlock even more pathways to get even more boxes and more gems, and yeah, you're gonna keep yourself really busy playing this game. Speaking of secret pathways, there are five levels in the game which contain secret gateways to a secret warp room containing five more levels. Three of the five gates in this warp room are just extensions to pre-existing levels, whether it be for a colored gem, or if they take you to sections where you can break more crates that you missed in your original run. However, two of the gates are to brand new levels containing two more gems, not to mention there's even more boxes compared to Crash's first entry speaking both numerically and as in new types of boxes. There there are newly added nitro crates which you die simply by touching. The good news is you can bash these green steel crates in order to remove all nitro crates in a level. At the cost of your own hearing of course. There's also reinforced steel crates which you have to belly flop to break. Well that was anticlimactic. Don't get too comfortable doing standard crash platforming because now you've got jet skis to drive, polar bears to ride, and once you're done with your furry friend, you can thank them by beating into a bloody pole to fuel your own selfish desires. <laughs> of course, there's the brand new hover pack, which you'll use to avoid lasers, bombs, and tentacle form. If only I had a hover pack to avoid talking about these bosses. Nice segue, man. Ripper Roo is back looking all scholarly, doing some nice scholarly things. So you have to avoid the TNT he plants on the ground, and then Nitro, until he blows himself up with it, allowing you to go in and spin him for the kill. Why a spin from Crash possesses more destructive force than f***ing explosives, I don't know. The Komodo Bros! Do I really have to say anything? Next up is Tiny, uh, sorry, Taz the Tiger, who's my favorite boss in the franchise up to this point. As he pursues you, you have to evade him by leaping from platform to platform until the rings you jump from start blinking red, which you have to then lure him into jumping towards because once they stop blinking, <laughs> They fall. Engine is up next, piloting a mech that shoots lasers, missiles, and more lasers. Wow! Surpassing Tiny, Engine is the best boss of the franchise so far. Ignoring the fact that his mech is destroyed by fucking <laughs> fruit. And it is such a shame that Cortex follows him up with, bar none, the worst boss battle in the original trilogy. Worse than Papu Papu, worse than Pinstripe, because just like some Spyro 1 bosses, Cortex doesn't even try to hit you. You just follow him through an asteroid field and hit him three times before he can escape. Whatever Crash can accomplish through its gameplay, as usual, is made up for with its terrific soundtrack as Josh Mansell strikes again. Or in this case, back. Funny stuff.
Crash Bandicoot 2 took everything wrong with Crash 1 and fixed it. Whether it be the save system, the difficulty curve, the boss sit. Okay, no, not the bosses. But even then, it tweaked little things in the game to make it as a whole that much better. Look at Crash, he doesn't walk like he can't bend his knees or elbows anymore. There's more personality to Crash through his death animations, running away from boulders and the big mama. There's more variety and overall graphical improvement to environments. The soundtrack accompanying them is even better than before. Yes, there are bits of level design and camera work that could have been executed a bit better. Bosses could have had a bit more thought put into them. And the story is stupid. But the positives here far outweigh the negatives. Crash 2 did exactly what it needed to do. It took Crash Bandicoot from a heavily flawed, dumb fun experience to something genuinely great and timeless. But of course there's still room for improvement. How will Crash 3 take things even higher? We'll find out after seeing if Spyro 2 could follow in Crash 2's footsteps. Considering Spyro the Dragon is considered one of Sony's two greatest mascots of all time alongside Crash Bandicoot, I of course had high hopes delving into the dragon realm. What I found instead was a stockpile of dragon dung filled with clunky controls and the and the shittiest excuses for bosses I have ever seen. Past all that, I saw a game that was pretty good. A game with truly near infinite potential, showcasing some interesting level and character designs and fun platforming. All it needed was more variety from a visual, gameplay, and musical aspect, and needed to take itself more seriously from a narrative standpoint, while still retaining the same charm that made the purple dragon and the world around him so endearing to begin with. Spyro 2 accomplishes this flawlessly. Creating a Shakespearean oh, yeah. tale in comparison to Spyro 1's childish schoolyard bullying. We cut to the dragon realm where it's raining all the time. Welcome to Scotland, you fucking prick! So Spyro decides to head off to Dragon Shores to soak up a few rays. As he jumps through the portal, he is intercepted by Hunter the Cheetah, Delora the Goat, I'm a fun, you dumbass, and the Professor. SpongeBob SquarePants. It's working! By the way, Tom Kenny voices like everyone in this game. Spyro is brought to their homeworld Avalar instead because they've been trying to bring a dragon to them. However, an evil sorcerer known as Ripto, uh, yeah. I don't know if you could tell, yeah. but, uh, yeah. he hates dragons, ah. has been wreaking havoc on the world of Avalar, and Spyro has been dragged here to save the day once more. It's not fantastic stuff, but it puts Spyro 1 to shame, already showcasing more personality than much of the previous game with a truly obnoxious villain that you love to hate and likable antagonist, right? off the bat. Much like the Dragon Realm, the world of Avalar is split into hub areas. Three this time instead of six. Summer Forest, Autumn Plains, and Winter Tundra. Each of the homeworlds contains several portals to different levels, most of them your typical Spyro platforming challenges you've come to be familiar with, and of course some of them the returning goddamn speedway. Spyro was previously about collecting all the gems, retrieving dragon eggs, and freeing imprisoned dragons. While gems make their return, there are now talismans which you retrieve at the end of many levels for helping out the citizens who inhabit that homeworld, and you can also earn orbs from them for helping them out with various tasks or just by looking around the levels. Some of these tasks can be as simple as feeding a tiki fish, going on a treasure hunt for the professor's pencil, or enjoying yourself a peaceful and calming game of hockey. Alright, one Spyro pucks right there for you. You got this. Get in there. No, come on, Spyro. Use your stubby little legs to get the. These minigames are perfect pace breakers found in just about every level. The worlds we travel to are host to more diverse environments than last time and are inhabited by unique NPCs. Whether they be turtles located on sunny beaches, cavemen residing in prehistoric wastelands, Eskimos populating icy glaciers, robots occupying a buzzing metropolis, etc. Not to mention each level you enter plays you a cutscene before the level showing you a bit about what Ripto has done to cause so much trouble. Did he just get crushed by an asteroid? Did he just get pushed into fucking lava? What is going on? And a new cutscene plays after showing how the good you've done has changed the world for the better. All these details help take Spyro's worlds from being window dressing for a bucket list of tests to be completed to worlds of living, <laughs> and most of the time, you stupid, <laughs> likable characters. Yeah! As well as adding tons of new minigames, Spyro can also perform brand new moves such as a hover at the end of his glide, and can be taught more to him for a like swimming, climbing, and head bashing by money bags that fat Go back to Beverly Hills, you capitalist! Enemies no longer drop gems when killed, but now they're souls? 
Okay. If you collect a certain amount of them, a gate in the level will grant you different power-ups, which typically allow you to complete a task for more orbs, or access more paths for more gems, and all that fun jazz. Diversity is something Spyro's gameplay desperately needed to escape its endless, pointless monotony, so new moves and new minigames of course help make your overall gaming experience much more fun and meaningful, even if Spyro's turning is still shit. By the way, Counter, can I call you that, buddy? Yeah, uh, I've been using these moves already for like 20 minutes. How about you make yourself useful and tell me a bit about these bosses because I cannot believe these battles were made by the same flippin' company as last time. Imagine going from this to this. First up, we've got Crush, who runs from ring to ring, sending off shockwaves and fireballs. In between the time he spends running, you have to flame him, which will send him into a frenzy trying to swat you with his club. If you evade his attack, he'll whack the ground instead, causing boulders to fall from the ceiling and crush him. <laughs> Definitely the weakest of the three bosses in the game, but still good nonetheless. Gulp, however... Oh my god, I spent a good 15 minutes on this f***ing Triceratops equipped with lasers. Pterodactyls will drop eggs from the sky filled with explosive barrels, bombs, homing rockets, and more, which you have to, obviously, use to take down Gulp. While you try to do that, you have to evade him running after you, trying to zap you, and even using your own firepower against you. He is a challenge that keeps you constantly on your feet, running away from him and racing from egg to egg, doing whatever you can to take him down. And after him, of course, follows the big baddie Ripto who is also fantastic. You charge after orbs which will grant you a unique superpower after collecting three of them. Using these powers you attack Ripto until he's done. Oh my god it's Mecha! Again, like the last battle, you have to race Gulp to the items shopping on the ground from above, pick them up, and fire them at Gulp. Thanks for actually making yourself useful, you stupid pro. Do this X amount of times, and Ripto's rampage is over. Oh my god, are you serious? As you soar into the sky, you take aim at Ripto's humongous birdie, until it and Ripto plunge into the lava below. At long last, Ripto's reign of tyranny has come to an end. No! No! What the fuck? So you've done it! You've collected all the gems and all the talismans and all the orb. Actually, no, for some reason that I will not complain about. You only need to get 8,000 of the 10,000 gems and 55 of the 64 orbs to access the kind of sort of bonus endgame area, Dragon Shores. By the way, I didn't explain this at the beginning, but you need orbs to power the portal to Dragon Shores, so, uh... Yeah, that's why you're collecting them. Here there are several attractions such as <laughs> laggy cannonball roller coasters with baby turtles tied down to the tracks, and tunnels of love that promote bestiality. <laughs> After completing any one of the park's mini games, you'll be awarded a token. Once you get 10 tokens, you'll be allowed access to the Dragon Shores Theater, which is just a device used to replay all the storyline cutscenes you've seen so far. <laughs> a bit disappointing considering I was hoping for a bonus cutscene, but at least it's not as disappointing as the 100% reward. Permanent Super Flame. Sure, cool. Uh, I'm glad I decided not to go for 100%. And I'm also glad I heard improvement in the soundtrack. The soundtrack, like last time, is still great, however, while still a bit repetitive, was able to find a bit more distinction because of the greater range of level settings. All in all, I am amazed by how much of a leap in quality Spyro 2 took from Spyro 1. There is so much depth and personality to the NPCs, Party hits. our new antagonists, and our new villains. The worlds we travel from feel so much more alive thanks to their charming inhabitants and the cutscenes played prior to and preceding them. Innovative level design and new moves keep things far from being tedious like before, and I cannot stress enough that the boss battles are by far the biggest improvements made. Sure, I can nitpick the soundtrack still being a bit too much of the same, and Spyro's turning being a wee bit 
well, shit. But I'm gonna choose to look past that here because Spyro 2 is a goddamn gem and I am thrilled to see what Spyro 3 brings to the table. But first, let's take a look at the final installment of the Crash Bandicoot trilogy to see if Naughty Dog could put icing on the cake of their own phenomenal sequel. Emerging from Naughty Dog as one of the top gaming mascots of the industry in the mid-1990s, Crash Bandicoot made quite a first impression with its colorful worlds and satisfying gameplay. However, it was dragged down by its underwhelming boss battle ludicrous save methods, and difficulty spikes. Over the next year, Naughty Dog worked rigorously, refining the formula to a T with tighter controls, new moves, more level variety, and a stronger soundtrack to boot, creating arguably one of the greatest PlayStation sequels ever, despite the bosses still being pretty trash. A little over two years after the level blower, Dickhead Marsupial's debut on the Playbox, Crash Bandicoot was released to the public, promoting a time travel adventure with several new gameplay styles, including a Yoshi cam, Cameo, playing with his sister, new powers, new villains, and more Clancy Brown than even your wildest dreams could hope for. But would Naughty Dog's renovations to the classic Crash formula be the cherry on top of the Crash trilogy? Yes, what kind of dumb question is that? Did you hear me? There's more Clancy Brown. Look, 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 he plays this evil talking board who is Cortex's boss? When was it ever hinted at that Cortex was working under someone? This is just kind of shoehorned in here as a means to progress the plot, and I just... Whatever, you know what? Who cares? I'm just here to mash the buttons. But I will not mash them buttons just yet, because I've got to let Mr. Uka Uka... Uh, it's Aku Aku backwards. Get it? Because he's the good one, and he's the bad one. <sighs> Scold Cortex for being a naughty dog for allowing... But in to foil his evil plans twice, but in the process of doing so, Cortex's space station crashed. Setting free this spooky boy from his temple prison where his twin brother Aku Aku locked him up long ago. However, with no crystals and gems left on the earth in the present day to power their worldwide conquest, Cortex and Uku Uku utilize the Time Twister machine built by Dr. Nefarious Tropi. The original Dr. Nefarious. <laughs> to retrieve crystals and gems from the past and future. <laughs> well, unless we get to them first. Unfortunately, with these new funky jumping physics, our chances of getting to them are pretty low. Okay, they're not that bad, I just needed a segue. Before, you used to be able to stop yourself in the air whenever you wanted, but now Crash will drift toward whatever direction he was initially moving, even if you try to pull him back. It's really not bad, it just takes some time getting used to, especially playing these games back to back, so it was worth mentioning to me. And hey, at least when you bounce on these crates now, you get two wampa instead of one, so that's cool. Speaking of cool, how about all the different game modes and time zones featured in the game? First off, we've got Medieval, Prehistoric, Arabian, Egyptian and futuristic levels featuring your classic Crash Bandicoot platforming. Spin, slide, and jump your way through the gauntlets gathering crystals, smashing crates, and grabbing Wumpa and doing some silky smooth moves. <laughs> oh, and don't worry, you've still got your signature chase levels, but instead of boulders, which is what we've been mainly accustomed to, except for that one time you pissed off a bear. <laughs> well, things haven't got much better for our buddy old pal Crash, because now a Triceratops wants to munch on his giblets. <laughs> but I guess you could say Crash got tired of running from imminent death and decided to swim with it instead in the form of Shanks. Yes, that's right, kids. You're about to go on the most okay diamond experience of your life. I mean, hey, variety's good and all that, and I appreciate Naughty Dog wanting to spice things up, but this is just... okay. Anywho! I do got a bit more to say about these bike racing levels, and it's not too... <laughs> They're not too bad, it's just that the other racers are kinda ASSHOLES! Your motorcycle control's okay, but it could be a lot better. No matter how much you try to slow down or drift into turns, you just find yourself sliding into the desert, which the sand has always reminded me of Cool Ranch Doritos for some reason. I don't know why, can someone please HELP ME? These levels aren't all bad though, because slithering by these desert rider douchebags by the narrowest of margins on your way to victory is one of the most euphoric things I have ever experienced in a video game. But how about we talk about the complete reverse opposite? of euphoria. These heckin' plain levels. The one with Coco isn't so bad. Mad Bombers, though... Alright, you know what, let's just focus more on Coco levels for now because I am not in the mood to have an end. Yes, as I mentioned earlier, you get to play as Coco in her own levels. Those being the plane level I already mentioned, and now the newly added jet ski levels, and she also takes over the iconic animal riding levels this time around, mounting... Like I said, the plane level, cool. All you really have to do is fly around and shoot down these blimps. This one, it's not too hard, it's just good. Deal with 
Or the jet ski levels are tubular. The controls are scrumptious. So you go at just the right speed. Your jet ski has just the right amount of tightness and its turns and jumps. They're an absolute boatload of fun. Except for Coco, which is basically an open space where you go on a manhunt for crates with virtually no obstacles serving any sort of challenge. I think I had a complaint just like that for a game I'm pretty certain I've reviewed already. <laughs> levels are both endless fun from beginning to end. They're incredibly fast paced as you can run for as long as you want, smash through barrels, evade dragons, jump from rooftops, they are just so so good. And as much as I love the polar bear levels from Crash 2, I think I lean in slight favor of these because of the pure madness they are. But don't let all these new fancy game modes distract you from just how fun Crash still is to play. You've got your signature jumps and spins and slides and THUNDERFLOCK! But after each boss you defeat in the game, you are granted a new power-up, which all make the gameplay more dynamic. With five bosses in the game, that means you've got five new power-ups to work with. The Super Belly Flop, Double Jump, Death Tornado Spin, Fruit Bazooka, and Speed Shoes. We've got some familiar faces returning as bosses, such as Tiny, Engine, and Cortex. And we've also got newcomers Dingo Dial and Entropy, who I mentioned earlier. Tiny's fight takes place in a Roman Colosseum, where he jumps after you, kind of similar to his battle in Crash 2. We'll try to stab you with this trident before you attack him and then he will send out a hungry pack of lions after you. From here the process repeats itself until he did where you will be rewarded with the super belly flop. The super belly flop is pretty contrived considering you could practically do the same thing it was designed to do in the last game. So it just comes across as they couldn't think of another power flop, so they just retconned your regular. Up next is Dingo Dial, and boy howdy, he is a thriller. I love him! Using his flamethrower, he will shoot fireballs into the air, which will throttle down and crash his direction. After avoiding these, he will shoot fire through his crystal shield, which will give you the chance to attack. As the battle goes on, his beams become more accurate, and by the end, he'll even start shooting two fireballs at once. It's really intense, and absolutely my favorite crash boss, both as a character, and as a fight in the franchise up to this point. You thrashed me, mate. No worries, but you'll soon be up against much worse. I mean, come on, with lines like that, how can't you love them? And how can't you love a good shortcut? Look how easy it actually is to beat this jump. <laughs> Thrashing Totodile will grant you the double jump ability, which is pretty fun and also pretty self-explanatory. So moving on to the master of time and space. Poor guy has no idea what he's in for. Entropy uses his giant fork thingy to shoot fireballs and lasers at Crash. After avoiding the obstacles, he'll slam his fork thingy into the ground, knocking the wind out of himself, creating a path for you to jump across and attack. Repeat this three times over and you've got yourself the DEATH TORNADO SPIN, which is my favorite power up in the game. The DEATH TORNADO SPIN acts not only as a longer spin attack, but also as a glide maneuver for Crash to surpass large platforming gaps, which is inherently satisfying. Well, you want to talk about really satisfying? Engine's boss battle here is glorious. For one thing, it's a two-phase battle, which we haven't seen from Crash Bandicoot before. Kinda. Where after defeating Engine's mech the first time, it transforms into another mech. Secondly, it takes place on the moon. And finally, it's Coco piloting a spaceship versus a giant mech, which shoots homing missiles, homing bombs, plasma balls, and has a death machine straight out of Call of Duty. And it's only fitting that the power-up you receive for defeating him is a fruit bazooka. And it's as cool as you'd expect. So you really have to use it. But then again, you don't really have to use any of these power-ups, do you? Remember how stupid Cortex's battle was in Crash 2? Well, he's made quite a comeback from last time. I mean, he's still the third or fourth best boss in the game. But hey, considering all of these bosses have actually been pretty good for a change, and he was literally one of the worst boss battles of all time in Crash 2, yeah, that's a good little spot for him. So the Mask Brothers start off in a beam struggle weeb style, while Cortex throws mines on the ground which you have to dodge until you make his way over to thump him into this black hole, only for him to rise back up and HOLY SHIT! And then the two masks do this tornado thing while Cortex tries to shoot you with his ray gun. Starts throwing mines again, black hole time. Oh, hi, Mark. Explosions, more mines, more spins. Dead. Granting you the final power up of the game, the speed shoes, which are used to help you complete the newly added post game challenge, time trial mode. Time trial mode is very simple, but can be infuriatingly difficult. Grab the clock at the beginning of a level to race to the end as fast as you can to get one of the three rankings of relics. Sapphire, which are the easiest to retrieve since you could practically get 
kept them from playing blind and with no hands. Yeah, Gold, which leave room for you to make a couple mistakes, but you still gotta stay sharp. And then there's platinum. And let me tell you, if you like your sanity right where it belongs, I would advise staying away from these at all costs. And they're not even necessary for 105% completion. You only need the gold relics, so... Yeah, don't hurt yourself like I did years ago. Remember how I said I'd wait to talk about Mad Bombers? Well, now is that time because the time trial is absolutely maniacal. I spent what felt like an eternity in pure agony over this crap only to get a sapphire relic by the most minuscule amount. So you bet your ass when I finally got that gold relic, I got covered to celebrate. Regardless of that baloney, the time trials are an interesting addition. They're a logical, practical extension to the game. Would I call them fun? Yes and no. It's a love-hate relationship. While it's so much fun to blitz through levels, once you fail, you come crashing down like a stone. But your ego just won't let you give up, so once you do win, it's a fantastic, addictive feeling. Once you retrieve five relics of any ranking, you'll notice a platform will spawn in the middle of the time twister machine. Jump on in and it'll take you to a secret warp room below the machine where for every five relics you win, you will gain access to a new level or a gateway to a secret area of a previous level. Which by the way, remember how I said Crash 2 had hidden warps to new levels or sections of levels in my previous review? Go check it out if you haven't seen it. Well, they're back in Crash 3 and they're... Like. Crash 2 used clever level design to provoke you to question why certain areas appeared the way they did. Why is there a staircase of nitro? Why are there random little icebergs floating here? Why is this gap extending out from the chasm? All these little details dared you to take risks you couldn't resist taking and you felt smarter for figuring these things out. Hot Cocoa is one of those levels in Crash 3. You want to know how you find it? By running over a very specifically planted sign in one of the racing levels. Agapus Rex is another secret level. Want to know how you access that? By being, air quotes, killed by this very specific pterodactyl in this very specific yellow gem root. Why would anyone in their right mind think, hmm, that pterodactyl looks awfully suspicious? You wouldn't! You would find this stuff by complete accident, and maybe that was Naughty Dog's intention to blow your mind when you think you're dead or you messed up or whatever, you get transported to this new world. I don't know. But if so, I think that's just a mistake on their part and takes away part of what made Crash 2 so rewarding to play. Anyway, unlocking all of these levels, of course, gives you the opportunity to retrieve all the gems and relics, and retrieving all of which will get you to 105%. Once you reach that, defeat Cortex again, and you will be treated to a bonus ending where the Time Twister machine gives in on itself because Entropy is not around to keep it stabilized, which is nice foreshadowing followed up on from before. Without Dr. Entropy's constant care and control, who knows what it will do? This sends Cortex, Entropy, and Uka Uka through what is presumably an infinite wormhole through time as... babies? Alright, cool. And hey, Josh Mansell's pretty cool. He's got some sick new tunes on the block. The best yet! Overall, Crash Bandicoot War! is a fantastic game. It's got beautiful level variety, awesome bosses, great music, cool villains who taunt you throughout the game, fun power-ups, engaging time trials, it's got all the goods you could want from a Crash Bandicoot game. Unfortunately, as fun as the power-ups are, they feel a bit tacked on since you never really have to go back to old levels to access areas you couldn't before just because of your lack of power-ups. But most importantly, some of the game modes are just... What? And have me wanting to simply play as good old Crash, which is a big deal since 15 of the 30 levels are strictly not Crash gameplay. Albeit 6 of those 15 are 2 game moons I really enjoy, but that's still a third of the game, leaving quite a bit left to be desired for me. Again, Crash Bandicoot 3, yeah that's right, you thought I was gonna do the thing, didn't you? It's still a great, great game, which I will play dozens of times over for the rest of my life, but despite all the great things Crash 3 did, I do have to lean slightly in favor of Crash Bandicoot 2 as my all-time favorite Crash game, but hey, 
That's just personal preference. Join me next time to see what Spyro Year of the Dragon had in store as the final installment of the Spyro trilogy, and if it could succeed or crash, fill a bit short as the trilogy's final entry. Speaking of which, I was just practicing a nearly impossible new move that I call the Nasty Nork. You know, it's funny you say that, Hunter. That's also what I call my signature sex maneuver. Spyro 1 was a bit of a mixed bag for me. Going into it with high expectations as the franchise is the rival to Crash Bandicoot, I was left a bit disappointed by the awkward controls, pathetic boss battles, and at times tedious collectathon style gameplay. However, at the core, there was plenty of potential yet untapped thanks to the great level structure, combat variety, and precision platforming. And this and then some was kicked up several notches in Spyro 2. More world building, better characters, be it protagonists or antagonists, actual boss fights, mini games to give some much needed spice even if some of them were bullshit. Spyro 2 was near perfection so the bar has been set sky high for the trilogy's concluding entry. And the game starts off pretty strong with the series most ambitious story to date. But really who gives a shit about that because now you can select these cute little save icons for your file. Spyro, Sparks, Hunter, Douchebag, Zoe 101, and who the fuck is that? An unspecified amount of time after the events of Spyro 2, our story begins in the Dragon Realm. Suddenly a hooded girl emerges through these weird rabbit hole things with her widow baby right on, storming through the dragon territory, stealing the dragon eggs. But this dumbass steps on Hunter's tail. <laughs> Waking all the dragons up, but her and her minions narrowly escape with all the eggs, which of course leads to Hunter and Spyro giving chase. We come to find out that this thief is Bianca, an apprentice sorceress under... The Sorceress. And she sounds like Frieza before the nicotine addiction. I hate you! And with that, your objective is set. Get the dragon eggs back and take down the sorceress. Try as she might to do everything she can to stop you from collecting the dragon eggs, it's evident pretty early on that Bianca isn't all bad. Even after being attacked by Bianca, which, by the way, who does she get her comebacks from? Vegeta? But I think we can look after ourselves. Try looking after this! I have to admire your ability to stand up after that. And I admire your ability to die! Hunter just thinks she's cute. How ironic, the pussy guy wants a mime not finishing that sentence. She never comes across as a real threat and mainly serves to build up the sorceress as the big baddie. Bianca doesn't want to hurt you unlike the sorceress who wants all the dragons dead. Fuck. This revelation sparks Bianca, who looks way too happy hearing about this, to make a full turn to the good side which had been teased throughout the game. At one point, she tries to create a monster out of a rabbit, but when the beast turns on her, Hunter jumps in to save her, and this is when a connection really starts to form between her and our heroes, especially Hunter. <laughs> Learning of Bianca's rescue at the hands of Hunter, the sorceress imprisons him, but even when encumbered, Bianca brings him food. Directly after learning that the sorceress wants the dragons dead so she can harvest their wings for an immortality spell, Bianca sets him free, and this is when she becomes a full-fledged ally to him and Spyro. I mean, I don't know why Bianca followed this jerk off around in the first place, but... It turns out that the dragons are the source of the sorceress's magic, but the sorceress was unaware of this when she banished them from the now-forgotten realms, the place where they used to rule 1,000 years ago. Wait a sec, dragons ruled the world? Ever since then, her magic and life force has steadily slipped away, but by creating an immortality spell, she can rid herself of the dragons once and for all while also not having to worry about, you know, death. The Forgotten Realms are of course the setting of the game and home to four hub areas. Sunrise Spring, Midday Gardens, Evening Lake, and Midnight Mountain. Each of these hubs are home to one new character who has been captured by the sorceress and has hired none other than that bumbling oaf money bags to keep them locked up. However, they can be unlocked once you pay that obese, idiotic, honey-inhaling, spineless, pompous, money-grubbing, moronic, derpy, gluttonous, fat, swamp as fuck! A small fee. Because this greedy dumbass can't even keep these guys caged up for the goddamn sorceress and he... When each of them kick his honey stuffed ass, and it is quite the cathartic little thing to witness. But what is even more satisfying is when you get to pummel him yourself or all your gems back at the end of the game. However, many of the gems you collect are not going to be collected by Spyro himself, but rather our four new friends I alluded to a moment ago. First up is Sheila the Kangaroo. She controls very similarly to Spyro, and in my opinion is easily the most polished out of the four new playable characters. 
Well, there's actually six new playable characters, but we'll get to that. Anyway, she can jump, double jump, mega jump, kick, and stomp, which is her take on Spyro's head bash, and she moves a bit faster than Spyro does when he's normally walking. While Spyro specialized in horizontal style gameplay due to his gliding, she's more of a specialist in the vertical aspect of things due to her mega jump. She's Australian because of course she is, is generally friendly and easygoing, but will literally kick ass if it comes down to that. I like her a lot. She's also a terrorist. Speaking of kicking gum and eating ass, Sergeant British Bird is a no-nonsense military sergeant. Although he quite funnily picks at the gaping plot hole as to why he couldn't just blast himself out of his cage. These are the latest military hardware. DBX-9 rocket launchers, state of the art. So why didn't you use them to escape? <laughs> Because. He's equipped with missiles, can fly, pick up objects, and he looks like he has seen some shit. Even though he's way too floaty, he's still decently fun in my book. Seriously, I have a book, The Lusty Argonian Maid. Give it a read, if you're over 18, of course. <laughs> Looking at Bentley the Yeti, you'd think he'd just be a brainless brute who smashes shit, but it turns out he's actually pretty sophisticated and has an expansive vocabulary. Why, you brazenly avaricious, duplicitous, larcenous ursine! I have no idea what you're saying. He does indeed smash shit, as I said, but you can also use his club to deflect incoming attacks. Although he's on the slower side, his simple yet destructive playstyle keeps him pretty fun for me personally when he's not being haphazardly thrown in into boxing matches cause his brother's a cowardly milk drinker who has a seat ready for him at Weenie Heart General with his name on it. And finally we have Agent 9, an excessively trigger happy monkey who's gone completely... Yeah. He's practically a pre-pre-pre-alpha test drive of Ratchet and Clank. He can throw bombs, fire lasers with his blaster, and even has a sniper mode. However, he has no real lock-on for his blaster and his strafing feature is awkward as hell. You can use R1 or L1 to strafe right or left, however, when you do, you will be locked into moving into that direction. In Ratchet and Clank games years down the line, you can hold down R2 or L2 to enable strafe mode, but you can still move freely. Here, he's just so... Unlike Spyro, who besides that godforsaken turning that I swear I'm the only one who has ever had a problem with, is as smooth as ever. He's still great fun to glide and charge and flame all over the place with, and he even keeps his abilities he learned from the last game, like swimming and head bashing. And... climbing ladders. Wow! Levels are colorful, diverse, and oozing with the typical personality you've come to expect from the geniuses at Insomniac. Alongside the dragon eggs, you as per usual also collect a jet. <clears throat> I said you collect the jet. Normally the gems are supposed to gravitate towards you when you get near them, but this glitch happens at least once a level to me where that just doesn't happen? I've complained about how tedious the gem collecting can be at times with this series, and this bullshit is not doing the game any favors. Also not doing this game any favors is the lack of cutscenes before and after each level like there was in Spyro 2. They were a huge memorable highlight and went a long way in building the world you're playing in and making everywhere you travel to feel like a place that existed before Spyro's arrival and would continue to exist after his departure. <sighs> Regardless, the levels are still as creative as they've ever been, like I said, Enchanted Tower spiraling towers, Firework Factory and its rivers of lava and grand castles, and Crystal Island's blissful landscape and atmosphere are just a few of the incredible set pieces. Oh, and you can't forget the ASMR penguins of Frozen Altars. Would you mind taking my place? Dragon eggs are of course scattered throughout every level. Sometimes they're just out in the wide open and easy to find. However, others can be really cleverly well hidden, but not absurdly hard to find like some of the secret routes of Spyro 1. And before anyone gets on me about Crash Bias, yes, Crash 2 pulled off this bullshit too sometimes, and don't even get me started on Crash 3. Not only are the dragon eggs retrieved simply through exploring the different landscapes, but also through the returning minigames, and oh boy, I've got a lot to say about these. There's some really fun minigames like the Whirlpool Tunnels, the Golden Goose Hunt, and the skateboarding challenges when Hunter's not harassing you. Sheesh, what happened? I could beat these guys with my tail tied behind my back. Shut the fuck up, Hunter! You couldn't beat Joe Swanson in a game of hopscotch! Oh. You bitch! The speedway challenges make their triumphant return as well, but the tasks you're prompted to complete by sparks are for gems only. You have to find Hunter hiding somewhere out in the level in order to activate the dragon egg challenge. This was a thing in Spyro 2 with the orbs, obviously, but I didn't touch upon it because I didn't even need to do any of the speedway since I already had enough orbs to get into dragon shores. I mean, when Hunter's hiding spots are this bullshit, can you really blame me for blowing them off? As for the challenges you get assigned by Hunter, it's basically just killing space farm animals most of the time. They're wacky, but they control super smoothly, so they're also 
really fun. And for our final playable character, we have Sparks, the thing that's been protecting you throughout this entire trilogy, like Aku Aku, who I somehow forgot to mention this entire time. Yay! Sparks' levels can be accessed after beating the world's boss. They're a top-down view arcade-style minigame where you have to venture through many different corridors and rooms, collecting gems and poning noobs until you reach a mini boss at the end of the level. Sparks can charge, fire, use power-ups for more potent attacks or temporary invincibility, and after beating the level, not only do you receive a dragon egg, but Sparks also learns a special ability to help Spyro throughout the rest of the game. Spyro can grab gems from further away, let Spyro take an extra hit on top of the four he can already withstand, open treasure chests, warp to any level through the game's atlas, and in my opinion, the most important one of all, you can hit all the shoulder buttons at once to point you in the direction of the nearest gems. This function alone would improve the gem collecting across all three games tenfold, and I really wish the developers thought of this sooner. Overall, Sparks' levels were a pretty harmless experience and are actually not the only parts of the game to feature mini-bosses. Between fights with a mechanical shark, two boring-ass dragons, and this jabroni from the icons, and that is where all my enjoyable times with Spyro 3 come to a screeching halt, because from here on out, things get pretty rough. Earlier I said that Bianca doesn't want to hurt Spyro and Hunter, which is true as she only wanted to scare them. The sorceress gets tired of her bullshit and gives her a spell book, and this is how the bulk of the bosses throughout the game are conjured up. Sadly, they're all quite mediocre. Buzz is the first boss you face and all you really have to do is bash him into the surrounding pool of lava and she will be there to bop him in the noggin. He hops around, occasionally tries to run you over, burn you, but all in all he goes down pretty easily. The music is unbelievably good here though and is one of, if not my favorite track in the whole trilogy, next to Ripto's theme. Up next is Spike who uses his blaster to fire plasma balls at you. Every now and then a ball of magma will appear on the ground from the surrounding area which you need to headbutt into him. Sergeant Bird also drops down power-ups like a stronger flame breath and crystals that explode on impact. He's better than Buzz but still nothing too special unlike his music which is very special. Scorch is the final one of the Sorceress's Beast and his design is fucking sick. Beginning the battle, he erupts with power, scattering blasts all over the arena, and as the battle rages on, Bentley assists you with a steady provision of combustible projectiles. And he even spits out minions who run towards you with TNT crates, among other cronies. He's a bit overwhelming at first, but once you get the hang of it, he's laughably easy, just like the previous foes. Once you collect at least 100 dragon eggs, you are able to take on the sorceress. And wow, how epic is this? Because my game glitched and gave me this Wii Sports ass music. And it's a shame because the intended music, like most of Stuart, Copeland's tracks is pretty good. So the sorceress hurls all kinds of crap at you with her scepter while Agent 9 shoots down turrets and hovercrafts and flying saucers. Who the hell thought it was a good idea to put these clumsy, sluggish, unpolished, arbitrary vehicles in the final boss of the trilogy. And why is Agent 9 the only one helping out here? What about Sheila, Sergeant Bird, Bentley, Hunter, Bianca? I was at least expecting Bianca since, you know, she said she wants to help you take her down. Spyro never even interacts with the sorceress before this either. This lady wants to kill the dragons and harvest their wings. We got great banter between Spyro and Ripto several times throughout Spyro 2, but we can't even get like... A 15 second cutscene between these two? And while the sorceress's battle is hard, it isn't because she's a legitimate challenge, because the biggest challenge here is overcoming these terribly optimized controls for a battle like this. And yeah, I at least used the turret and hovercraft a couple times before this, but the saucer? No! I haven't even used this thing once up to this point throughout the whole goddamn game! What a disappointing, pathetic, unsatisfactory finale! Oh, I get it. They're saving the big climactic battle for the 100% end day. What the hell is this? We're both on flying saucers just blasting at each other, and that's it! You get the final leg of the game, one last cutscene where a baby dragon just burps, and that's the end! That is the finale to this roller coaster trilogy. This is easily the worst 100% reward in the series and easily the worst mini games I had to go through to get to this point. I had to play whack-a-mole with these brainless buffoons who were also trying to go after these moles who constantly kept getting in my way. Not that there's anything technically wrong with this minigame, it's just not fun at all. 
got stuck on this abysmal hovercraft demolition derby for nearly an hour because this junk shoots like shit and moves infuriatingly awkwardly like I'm not even in the arena yet just give me a chance I had to go through this dreadful shooting range with agent 9 where bullets didn't even seem to register against these assholes and sometimes you don't even have a chance to defend yourself because within a millisecond these rootin tootin pieces of shit are riding your ass dual wielding pythons while sticks of dynamite are hurtling towards your head faster than a Randy Johnson fastball oh and this dumbass race against the yetis after you've collected everything in the game like I'm done I did what you asked me just take me to the loot level take me to the secret boss just give me what I want 90% of the reason I came this far was because the regular ending is underwhelming as hell and you know what the regular ending is honestly way better than the hundred percent one mini games like the swimming tunnels might be hard but when I died I never thought this game is bullshit when I died I knew it was my fault I knew I was the one in control and that I needed to keep improving in order to win whereas with the hovercraft and witch mini games I either got by through sheer luck or by exploiting a weakness in the system the skateboarding sessions against hunter gave me some trouble but they just took some time getting used to i never ever thought that the game was at fault for my performance spyro fans know there's a general consensus that spyro 2 also has its fair share of bull honky mini games saving the cavemen tailing the spy and good old trouble with the trolley eh now that last one i'll give you it sucks. However, I personally never had much trouble with any other minigame throughout my entire experience. And that's the thing. Trouble with the trolley was annoying as hell, but by the end of the adventure, I pretty much forgot about it, and it had no real lasting impression on my opinion of the game. Games like that were nothing more than a speed bump, whereas these mini games are potholes plastered around every corner. If anything, sure, maybe Spyro 2 went a little too far with the variety, but it never actively hindered my experience because variety isn't an inherently bad thing. When that variety isn't fun, controls like shit, and steals the spotlight from the core gameplay I signed up for, like in crash 3 to an admittedly much lesser extent that's when variety becomes a problem variety was my biggest gripe with crash 3 but it was still a spectacular game because it was backed by great bosses perfected controls logically sound extensions to the core gameplay and legitimate challenges when i eventually play the reignited trilogy down the line i do hope to find that these games got the polishing they deserve mainly spyro 1 and 3 because 2 was already perfect mm. spyro 2 left me with really high hopes for the threequel but unfortunately this game is just rushed no cutscenes before and after each level it's the laggiest and glitchiest out of the bunch at least in my experience sergeant bird and especially agent nine are pretty unpolished several mini games are way too slow inaccurate and or generally unoptimized it desperately tries to be diverse because variety it's the final entry in the trilogy meaning quantity over quality we have to throw absolutely every idea at the wall we have like agent nine flinging his poo the greatest hits version even adds missing music fixes bugs and an entire missing cutscene because of how rushed this game was and unfortunately the version I own sold on the PlayStation Store for some reason is the original version and not the greatest hits version like why and to that you might say well it's not fair to be reviewing an unfinished version but if they thought what they originally sold was good enough then oh well that's what I'll judge them on because 2000 is not like today where you can just slap on a free 50 gigabyte patch and be done with it it saddens me to say that I don't think I'll ever be touching this game again unless like I said there are some major tweaks made in the reignited version this is not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination but it takes several steps back after Spyro 2 established how much more this series is truly capable of and that is why this search for the baby dragons is nothing more than a scramble <laughs> After the astounding success of the box bashing bandicoot, okay. Naughty Dog had to put the poor dog down to avoid being tied down by Universal Interactive. Wanting to develop games strictly for Sony, this unfortunately had to lead to the team parting ways with the bandicoot, the poor thing, going on to develop their next hit series, Jack and Baxter. While on the surface, the series received similar levels of praise, don't let that understate the monumental leap in quality Naughty Dog's newest undertaking took, and not just because of the sheer power of the new hardware found on the PlayStation 2. Naughty Dog decided to push their previous limits with a while not earth shattering more in-depth story this time around on an unnamed planet powered by the mysterious energy known as eco created by the precursors samos the sage the master of green eco and narrator of the opening cutscene introduces us to protagonist jack and daxter who make their way over to investigate the prohibited misty island against the sage's orders only to be ambushed by a lurker which causes daxter to be knocked into a pool of dark eco and 
We must revert Daxter back to his old self, but the only way to do that is to confront Gol Acheron, the Dark Eco Sage far to the north of their native village. However, Samos can't just simply teleport you there because none of the other sages have opened their portals for an extended period of time. So the only way to make it north is to traverse Fire Canyon with Samos's daughter Kira's Agrab Zoomer, and even that requires 20 power cells to charge the heat resistant shield. And so from there, you embark on your adventure, collecting as many power cells as possible from the locals across the land in exchange for precursor orbs, or for performing various tasks for them, such as bringing a sculptor back his lost pet, doing some fishing, and protecting this guy's snacks from swamp rats. And for every power cell you collect, Jack and Daxter perform some sort of celebration, and that's an epic gamer moment. You can also find power cells scattered throughout the wild, or exchange 120 orbs for them from demonic cookie monster. And you can also get them by setting free 7 scout flies from each area of the game. I felt very motivated to continue collecting anything I could because the various landscapes are so much fun to explore from peaceful beaches right. to snowy mountaintops and even a lost underwater city. But man, FUCK THIS STUPID CAVE! While the saturation and contrast can be a little overbearing at times, Fire! You just can't help but gush over and be sucked in by the charming, hypnotizing atmosphere which was for sure mind-blowing in 2001 and still holds up incredibly well today. The composer of the original Crash games, Josh Mansell, even sticks around for this new venture. And while for the most part he doesn't create bangers like he did in Crash 2 and 3 except for this boss fight which sounds like Crash and Kirby engage in Coitus and I love it, he does return to his Crash 1 roots a bit to deliver some serene ambiance. The music is even a bit dynamic as well as the instruments alter slightly as you reach different branches of the same area. The world flows together so seamlessly due to its day-night cycle and lack of loading times, and the fact that the portals make for a practical fast travel mechanic, which I adore. And if I'm gonna talk about how well this world flows together, then of course I have to discuss the various types of eco. Green eco restores your health, blue eco powers doors, platforms, and launch pads. Blue allows you to run faster and even breaks objects in your vicinity with its pure <laughs> Red eco boosts your attack potency, and yellow eco shoots fire at all. There's also, of course, dark eco boxes, which act similarly to Nitro from Crash Bandicoot. Over the course of your adventure, you have to open eco vents throughout the world, and opening them will allow you to venture back to previous areas or collect certain items that you weren't able to without the specific eco's power before, and I love that. And I also love Jack, just look at this hippity hoppy boy and his brilliant moveset. You can jump, double jump, crouch jump, spin kick, punch, uppercut, roll, bash, crawl, even though you literally never need to crawl once the entire game. There are just so many combinations you can do, and it it makes Jack so much fun to experiment with and even simply watch him perform the moves due to his stretch and squash animation style. Platforming doesn't remain as the only gameplay style however as of course you use the zoomer I mentioned earlier not only to traverse landscapes linking together the separate regions of the game but also in the precursor basin to chase after lurkers and moles and race through rings and a mini track for power cells. And it's honestly not that fun like thanks can you turn that thing off I wasn't in the middle of a race or anything here dipshit. But besides that detour it is a very fun vehicle to utilize to race through Fire Canyon, the Mountain Pass, and to chase down the balloon lurkers out on the water at Misty Island. But my favorite deviation from the core gameplay has to be the Flut Flut, a bird you actually hatch towards the beginning of the game for a power cell, and he is adorable. Oh no! No, 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 no! He showcases incredible jumping power and can charge attack and run at fairly quick speeds, and I wish we got to see a bit more of him since he only has two playable sections in the game. The gameplay and world in the Precursor Legacy fires on all cylinders, just as the Mute Jack and Loudmouth Daxter's dynamic does. Their dynamic oozes chemistry and genuinely got some laugh out loud moments from me. It's a little glowing squirrel about your size, full of spunk, and crazy as a lark. Oh, I get it. Like a sidekick. The first boss of the game also gave me a good laugh. It's a plant which was corrupted by Dark Eco found deep within the temple of the Forbidden Jungle. Spiky bug turtle things pursue you, which you mop up with ease before the plant extends leaves from itself, allowing itself to be attacked. It's weird how it just gives away its weakness like that, but yeah. Do that a couple more times and you win. 
Well, that sucked. Moving on to that good shit. We take on Claw, the monster who's been wreaking havoc on the Blue Sage's rock village. Hurtling boulders at you from afar, a ball of blue eco will eventually reveal itself. Once you've absorbed its energy, you can pursue the enormous lurker and blast it with some long-ranged attacks thanks to yellow eco. Then you have to run back to the floating platforms from the beginning and repeat the process a couple more times until he collapses into the lava one last time. Honestly, it's really fun and not ridiculously challenging, but it's still harder than it looks. Or maybe I just suck, I don't know. After making it to the Red Sages, Hudgol and his sister Maya reappear for the first time since the opening cutscene and disclose their diabolical plot to take over the world. They've been corrupted by the power of Dark Eco and kidnapped the other sages, planning to use their Eco power to give life to their precursor robot they're building. This robot would open silos of Dark Eco from all over and release it into the open, warping the world to their liking whatever that means. I wish they fleshed out these guys a bit more since their motive is practically unknown and they're blander than a trip to the toilet without my phone. Jack and Daxter make their way to the villain stronghold to free the sages Gull and Maya imprisoned and to destroy their robot and end their plans once and for all. After firing Yellow Eco at the machine's eye, you leap into the air to avoid the incoming explosion, after which Dark Eco-powered lurkers emerge from the slowly opening silo and you have to take them down. From here, you continue to attack the robot's exposed areas Where? while evading various erupting blasts and fireballs until the four colored ecos produce light eco, energy which you could use to turn Daxer back to normal, but you make the dumbass choice of saving the world instead. Stay fuzzy, save the world. Choices. Okay, fine. We'll save the world. Jack attains Ultra Instinct, then Jack and Daxter do some ridiculous TikTok challenge, and Jack gets cock blocked, you furry dickhead. Credits roll, and then it's revealed that 100 power cells can open this ancient precursor door. Although I was really satisfied with the regular ending, I decided to say fuck it and spend an extra 20 minutes getting six more power cells, only to open the door and find. I don't even know. Apparently it's linked to Jack 2, so I guess we'll see about that. But for now, let's just celebrate what the Precursor Legacy achieved. The gameplay is smooth and it finds a near perfect balance between platforming and spicing things up with vehicles. But not enough foot foot, God damn it! The graphics are gorgeous, the music fits the tone of the world wonderfully. There's a competent escalation in difficulty as the game progresses. The characters are endearing, the game is genuinely funny and charming, etc. Other than the Precursor Basin and the underdeveloped villains, I really can't think of anything bad to say about this game. Well, besides the cutscene transitions. Sometimes they'll cut to black for a couple frames or something weird like this happens where stuff just doesn't load in or the scene has to resize itself but I'm pretty sure that's just a bug with the HD collection. Overall, Jack and Daxter was a spectacular experience and one that I wish I gave a fair chance to sooner instead of hating it for no reason like I did when I was a little kid. Fucking dumbass. Well, shoot my dog and call me Sally. What? What the fuck? Just as Naughty Dog had to put down their Naughty Dog, Insomniac had to part ways with everyone's favorite purple pass. And it turned out absolutely horribly. And they had to say goodbye for basically the same reason Naughty Dog had to with Crash. Insomniac never actually owned Spyro and was in fact owned by Universal Interactive. They're the real money bags here, capitalist pigs. And Insomniac must have some sort of capitalist fetish because what's the theme of their new series, Ratchet and Clank? Money. But how did Ron and Cole meet? Well, it all started on this really cool home screen, okay? I cannot stress enough how much I love this calm before the storm vibe I'm getting from this. It's just really cool. Anyway, so the next morning, the game begins on Ratchet's home planet, Veldin, with him trying to build his spaceship. Where does he want to go? I hear you totally not asking. I don't know. Then we hard cut to a factory somewhere else in space to see B54296, aka Clank. And I love how they came up with his name. My serial number is B54296. Oops. I'll just call you Clank for short. But before we get to that, we actually have to find Clank who crash landed on Veldin after escaping from his factory, because an infobot showed him anal golf. Or Drex plans to destroy the universe. Could have been that too. And our adventure truly begins with this extensive shot of the area and some funky ass beats to accompany us shit stomping some frogs. The amazing music and visuals are consistent throughout the game, with the music somehow managing to be atmospheric, catchy, and simply memorable all at the same time in a majority of the different locations. Between vast landscapes, cityscapes, tropical settings, and space stations, there's eye candy to marvel at every corner, and the game knows how good it looks because as I mentioned with the massive shot of Veldin, the game does this with every level you enter, and there are some amazing ones where you can really feel the scale of the world you're exploring. The aesthetic of this game from top to bottom 
even the menus and loading times is on point. Mostly joking aside, after mowing through the waves of enemies occupying the plateau, we find the unconscious Clank and bring him back to Ratchet's home. As he continues to work rigorously on his spaceship, Clank surprises him and mentions that he is looking for Captain Quark, the galaxy's most famous superhero for some reason, <laughs> in the hopes of getting him to help take down Chairman Drek. Drek is trying to build the perfect planet for his people after his planet has become too polluted to be inhabitable, so he's ripping apart certain components of other planets across the galaxy and meshing them all together to create a super planet for his people to live. This obviously would lead to the extermination of billions and billions of people, and in the end Drek doesn't even actually care about saving his species because this is all one big scheme for money. As for every square inch of this new planet he creates, he is getting paid for. He is the one who polluted his his old planet and he plans on continuing this vicious cycle for years and years making a fuck ton of money over and over again. He's ruthless, merciless, has a bit of humor to him. Stop this madness now! Okay, wait. You're right. I will withdraw my troops. Really? No! Now of course the only way to find Quark is to use the Ratchet spaceship which coincidentally is lacking a robotic ignition system which Clank of course is equipped with. The two head for Novalis and Shrek has his troops ambushing the planet as he kills anyone who gets in the way of creating his new one. Our two heroes land on Novalis and they're behind their dead. Oh wait no they're alive but they somehow contracted mild ventriloquism in the accident. We're not leaving the way we came in. Perhaps we could procure a ship from- What? Navalis is the perfect first level, introducing the meat and potatoes of what you can expect. Like Navalis, just about every game in the level divides into multiple pathways, each with a unique objective. Paths usually lead to gold bolts, items, gadgets, weapons, or coordinates for your next destination to continue the story. Each pathway offers something that will either progress your journey or enhance your experience during it. Plus there's different soundtracks for different pathways of the same level, so that's neat. On this planet, we're also introduced to the Gadgetron Vendor. Hi there, Fuzzball. The Gadgetron Vendor, of course, sells weapons and ammunition in exchange for bolts, which you can acquire by smashing crates, dispatching enemies, and there comes a giant fish! <laughs> destroying pieces of the environment, or even by using a metal detect- <laughs> ah, fuck, it was the trap I drank, I've fallen into consumerism. Bolts don't typically come in large quantities, so it would be wise to buy as little weapons and ammunition as possible for as long as you can hold out for. I mean, honestly, a bunch of them aren't even that good, anyway. Ratchet's wrench is strong enough as is for a good portion of enemies even capable of one hit KOing towards the end of the game. You can simply swing your wrench, throw it, and even jump and strike with it, alright, fuck me. But when your wrench can't get the job done and a proper strafing function doesn't exist so you keep getting mauled, no this doesn't count, it still sucks and got introduced two thirds of the way through the game, there are a few weapons that can really save your hiney. The blaster is available very early on and is a good high rate of fire middle range weapon, and honestly is more useful against the final boss than any other weapon I purchased. But that definitely doesn't make it your most valuable asset because that honor belongs to the Visabomb. This thing is a necessity for taking down larger and more powerful enemies like ships and spotlights. The Pyrocitor is a good one used in the beginning third of the game, especially against devilish fucks like these, but gets severely outclassed by the Tesla call once you have the means to afford it, if you even do. Yes, I could afford it so I'm better than you. But the drone device will work just fine for dealing with those herds of smaller enemies as the drones act like a shield. Ironically enough, the small enemies are your biggest threat in this game, and no that's not me making fun, these guys literally whooped my ass dozens of times. And I've got a dozen different things to say about the combat. On one hand, the lack of a good strafing ability does hinder the experience, leaving you awkwardly walking in circles trying to evade incoming attacks, and weapons aren't always so quick to lock on either. There's instances where you have to manually aim down, but that just leaves you wide open, so that's not very ideal either. Also you have this quick select ring, and by holding triangle you can quickly swap out your weapons and gadgets, but when you use the ring the game doesn't pause, so again, you're leaving yourself wide open. Sometimes it's best to just take the long route of pausing the game, going to the menu and selecting the tool you need. Luckily this never gave me much of a problem, but of course it's something still worth noting as Ratchet can only take 4 hits before he croaks, I mean look at the poor guy he spent. Unless you buy premium and ultra nanotech. Nanotech is the energy that restores your health, and the latter of those two is pretty expensive. Surprisingly this caution you have to approach combat with also works in a way, as you have to be more calculating about your ammo since it can be fairly expensive for certain weapons. On top of that, as I said, you don't have much health to work with, so you can't just bull rush the competition guns blazing like later installments give you more liberty in doing. Not that the way 
the games after this does things is wrong, but I guess what I'm trying to say is if you play your cards right, this works too. Although I admittedly found myself relying on the Viz Bomb way too much towards the end of the game, so yeah. Although you spend plenty of time blowing shit up with guns, you also blow shit up with jet fighters, which control really smoothly and feature your standard rapid fire lasers and missiles. You only use the jet fighter a handful of times, but it makes the most of its screen time, as it's pretty fun. There's also two turret sections in the game, and I know everyone hates turret sections, but these were actually pretty alright in my opinion. Oh, and you also do hoverboard races. First one's alright. Second one can suck a cheetah's dick. While bolts are mainly used for buying weapons and all that nuclear jazz, you also have to sometimes use them to buy infobots off of all the scoundrels in this universe. Akin to the cutscenes from Spyro 2, infobots show you a little movie to give an introduction to what you can expect to encounter at your next destination. And of course, the videos are hilarious. Thank you guys for picking up Spyro 3's slack. The cast of characters you come across are, you guessed it, oozing with personality. Between Skid McMarks, which is a shitty pun, the plumber, Geronimo, Al, Mark Apply, mean Captain Quark, I never wanted to skip a cutscene because the various cast of characters always kept me so entertained. You will find raritanium for me. No, I will not. He's a junk. Not to mention the way Ratchet and Clank play off each other. Hey, you're that robot guy, right? No, actually, I build robots. I myself am not a robot guy, per se. <laughs> Nerd. I like him. While Ratchet's not a horrible person, I wouldn't necessarily call him a good person when the game begins, or even for the majority of it for that matter. Ratchet's ill-mannered, self-absorbed, and focuses way too much on trying to have fun rather than the task at hand, while Clank is pure-hearted, always trying to do the right thing, and tries to waste no time saving residents and planets of the galaxy and putting an end to Drek's plans. But this sharp contrast between the two leads to some money moments between them as well. There's an awful plot being hatched to destroy our planets. Ratchet, he knows. Great. Does that mean we can go hoverboarding now? Throughout the game, Clank receives various upgrades such as a helipack and jetpack, each allowing Ratchet to charge forward, jump higher, and hover. The jetpack can also be used to bust these buttons that appear here and there. But Clank is more than Ratchet's parachute. He is his own man, and he has his own sidekick, Skadjabots. Fuck me! These little dumbasses will follow Clank's every command and will carry out their master's wishes relentlessly. Just look at these ferocious liquidators absolutely eviscerating their prey! <laughs> Honestly, there's not much to Clank missions. They're basically escorting these little guys from point A to point B while evading hazards, and if one of them gets destroyed, you have to go back to where they originally spawn and escort them again, until you can get all of them into their own little house thing. Again, not terrible, not good either, it's just kinda... Eh? And I guess by the end of the game, the developers got tired of Clank Sections 2 and decided to create Giant Clank, who completely obliterates anyone and anything in his way. And as you'd expect from Mindless Destruction, it's really fun, just like the grind boots. You just ride along these rails, avoiding whatever hazards come your way, but I just love grinding and sledding and riding sections and all that in games, and this absolutely meets the mark for me. There's also Magna Boots, which allow you to divide- there's also Magna Boots, which allow you to divide gra- yeah. There's also Magna Boots, which allow you to divide- Fuck. Fuck. You can walk on magnetic walls, you know what I'm saying. They don't offer much from a gameplay perspective, but they're enjoyable for the spectacle alone. There's also several cool gadgets that help to break the pace of the game, shifting the focus to more puzzle-orientated gameplay. There's the Trespasser, which is an infiltration device used to hack doors through laser puzzles. They're a lot of fun, and some of them are really thought-provoking, and admittedly I beat two or so of them by complete accident. But I love the challenge they bring to the table. The Hydro Displacer fills and drains pools, and sometimes you have to fill and drain several times due to things in your way before you can make it across how fun the swing shot is used to swing obviously and it's not really used too cleverly except for this one amazing time on Ultanus as a pathway to a gold bolt and it's horrifying how much my blood was pumping during this which leaves us with the hollow guys and it's fine you just use it to fool these dumbass robots into opening doors for you. And these aren't the only robots who get fooled because Clank does too. Stupid defect, I knew he should have been aborted. So after eventually tracking down Captain Quark, he tells you to meet him at his headquarters to complete his gauntlet to ascend to the rank of heroes. After completing the course, he encourages you to step onto this platform and Ratchet doesn't seem too convinced. But it turns out, Ratchet was right to be suspicious. Clank, who was eager to be rewarded by Quark, drags Ratchet onto the platform, causing them to fall right into his trap. Yes, that's right, Quark's been secretly working for this whole time as he's been paid to be the spokesman for Drek's new planet. What? No way! I didn't see that coming! Quark forces the duo to tackle the infamous Blargy and Snagglebeast. But... Why? But... 
Why? Ah! The same beast that nearly felled Quark years ago, and it's easy as piss. All you have to do is shoot him until he puts a shield up, prompting you to lead him onto a bridge over lava, which he causes to collapse. Cause he's fat. Ah! Do that a few times and that's it. Pathetic bosses are mostly a theme for this game. I mean, just look at this idiot. Of more importance here though, is the fact that this causes a schism between Ratchet and Clank. Holy shit. And despite the galactic threat Drek poses, Ratchet blatantly disregards the potential annihilation of literally billions of people across the galaxy just so he can settle the score with Quark. Which is psychotic. I get that Ratchet wanted to leave Veldon and see the universe, and he kind of just got dragged into this superhero stuff by Clank, so he doesn't necessarily see saving the galaxy as his responsibility, but still, come on, guy. As time goes on, though, the seeds are planted as he slowly does begin to realize the severity of the situation. After running some more errands across the galaxy, the duo head off for the Gemlik moon base. Clank wants to find Drek, and of course, Ratchet wants to find Quark. Luckily enough for Ratchet, Quark was ordered by Drek to personally dispatch the two. In space. It's your little jet fighter versus Quark's big boy with him firing missiles and more missiles at you until he sends out a fleet of goons to help out his quickly going downhill battle. Once you take care of them, he starts shooting bombs at you and then he's done. It's an alright fight made much more fun by the spectacle of it taking place over this moon base he just had to conquer. And it's nice to finally see Ratchet really begin to put this Quark shit behind him after realizing just how selfish he's really been and all the damage he could have prevented from the start had he just focused on Drek. After exploring the planet that Drek left in ruins below the base, you purchase an infant about from this poor guy who can't hear anymore because of all the bombs Drek set off. Hey, look, you can think I'm an asshole for laughing. At least I didn't joke about it. No one is around to buy anything. Are you okay? Low prices? Oh, you bet! The infobot contains coordinates for Clank's home planet, but before you can get into the factory where he was created, you need the hollow guys that I mentioned earlier. After breaching the factory, you reach the room where Clank was born, and an infobot discloses Drek's plan to destroy Veldon with a deplanetizer, and have his new planet take its place because Veldon, as Drek claims, occupies the perfect orbit, but we all know Drek's just being an asshole. This is where Ratchet fully realizes that shit is getting real, and he shouldn't have been such a selfish, narrow-minded c- And with that, your journeys come full circle all the way back to Veldon, complete with a crushing atmosphere as Drek's new planet is fully constructed and looming above. After making your way through Drek's forces, you confront the not-so-big man and a big bot himself, and I guess Insomniac saved all their goodies for the final fight because this fight is pretty darn good. The battle begins with a short-lived collision between Giant Clank and Drek's mech, after which you pursue Drek as he fires missiles, explosives, and homing bombs at you. Eventually, the battle moves over to the Deplanetizer. Here, Drek will throw at you what I've already mentioned on top of these big-ass evil Gadgetbots and firing plasma balls at you. Below also activated the planetizer a couple of times, and you have to smash the button with Clank's jetpack to disengage the countdown. Towards the end, missiles start flying all over the place, and I never actually noticed them hurt me at all. I feel like they're there to just add to the chaos of the situation and inflict more shit, shit, shit into the player. Anyway, this boss is good as fuck. After defeating Drek, he accidentally turns into planetizer towards his planet, and you blow it and him to smithereens. Ratchet and Clank almost die, Clank breaks his arm saving Ratchet, and after saving Ratchet's life, he still leaves Clank for dead. God, I hate this stupid brat! Well, never mind, Ratchet turns back and is like, hey, where you going? We gotta fix that all. In all seriousness, this ending is very heartwarming. After the credits, it's a Saturday with the boys at the Ratchet Warehouse as they watch a commercial of Steve Mc... Quark. Demonstrating Gadgetron's new personal hygienator to their absolute horror. Once the epilogue wraps up, you're given the choice of either warping back in time to before you defeated Drek, or restarting the game with your current weapons, bolts, and gold bolts. In this renewed playthrough, you will earn bolts at a faster rate, and you can also purchase gold weapons with those gold bolts I've mentioned. In conclusion, several weapons weren't worth a buy, and the main combat could use some refinement due to it being a bit too loose and awkward. Ratchet's a bit too much of an asshole during that middle portion of the game, but it does make for great redemption of his character and makes his reconciliation with Clank all the more sweeter. Ratchet and Clank is filled to the brim with brilliant music, a fantastic aesthetic, charismatic characters, remarkable level design, varied gameplay with mostly tight responsive controls, and a simple yet captivating story. With that said, Ratchet and Clank is truly Quarktastic! Oh wait, forgot to mention the Rhino, which is by far the most expensive and powerful weapon in the game. It absolutely fucks. Okay, come on. What's a rhino, anyway? Rip ya a new one. What did you just say to me? <laughs> so with the dynamic duos of Jack and Daxter and Ratchet and Clank on the scene, it looked as if Naughty Dog and Insomniac were once again ready to go to battle for mascot supremacy. But they both just got sucker punched because here comes a fucking circus raccoon to literally steal the spotlight. And his name is... Right, so you're probably wondering what he's yelling about. So this is Sly Cooper.
Wait, no, 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 not him. No, this is Bentley and this is Murray. And these guys met in an orphanage after Sly's family was murdered by a gang of crooks. Yes, and English just got dark very fast. Known as the Fiendish Father. It's not intimidating at all. The Coon Clan had their family heirloom, the Thingus Rakamagookus, ripped away from them, with its pages shredded and scattered across the globe, or flat earth, whatever you prefer. Sly comes from a long line of master thieves, each ancestor specializing in different thieving abilities, and said abilities were logged into the book to be passed down to future generations. The difference between a master thief and your everyday <laughs> raccoon is that master thieves only steal from other thieves, as Sly claims there's no fun in stealing from ordinary people, but I guess Sly never played Skyrim. That brings us to present day Paris where Sly and the gang, but mainly Sly, it's really all Sly, break into police headquarters to retrieve more information on the Fiendish Five so they can find the members and steal back the thing as Rakamagookus. After snagging the case file from Interpol Inspector Carmelita Fox's office, Sly's intercepted by her and they're just so dandy every time they're on screen together. A little dinner, a little dancing, I think I can help you out. Hmm, sounds romantic. As long as you don't mind dining in jail. Nah, I hear the surface is lousy. However, it was at this very moment that I realized Sly's mouth moves in an incredibly unsettling fashion. Like the little thieving rascal he is, Sly's very cunning, quick-witted, and suave. And a bit of a dick. Murray part-time driver and full-time burden. While Carmelita's obviously on the other side of the law, obsessed with putting the Cooper gang behind bars. And while they won't admit it yet, they've got a little something going on for each other, eh? Eh? So you bust a move through the fire escape all the way down to the team van and make an epic getaway. <laughs> Gosh. From what we've seen between the gameplay and cutscenes, I'm sure you've already noticed the unique comic book aesthetic this game goes for. It really gives the cutscenes a Saturday morning cartoon vibe and helps Sly Cooper form its own identity against the competition. Going one step further with that is the stealth-based acrobatic gameplay. Sly has your traditional platforming controls like jumping and attacking, but he can do plenty of cool tricks like climb pipes and ropes and walk along edges and uh... Well, that's all you can really do at the beginning of the game. But there's plenty of abilities you unlock from recovering the lost pages of the thing as Rakamagookus, such as electric rolling, <laughs> and exploding heads. Okay, look, could Sly's dad not read or something? How could he die when he should have been an electric, exploding, time warping god coon? But how can you turn into the Chad coon? by retrieving clue bottles spread throughout each level like the good little furball you are. And once you collect all the clue bottles in an area, Bentley can decipher the safe's code, allowing you to snag a hip new ability or upgrade your Binocucom, which is a device that lets you scan the area. These upgrades range from telling you the location of breakable objects in the area, clue bottles, and even giving you descriptions of enemies in the level. You also use the Binocucom to communicate with Bentley and Murray, and who else thinks that Bentley looks like he's wearing a dress? But where you really make the most of your thieving capabilities are by lighting torches, racing monkeys, and fighting crabs with a submarine. Ah, yes. Very Master Thievey. I felt more sneaky and crashed to insanity. While admittedly the submarine and this vehicle I guess Sucker Punch don't even know what to call it either, control perfectly, and I mean perfectly, they don't really fit thematically with the whole sneaky slippery boy thing they set out for. It wouldn't bother me as much if Murray did some of these missions, since one, it gives him something to do rather than be a fucking bitch, and two, he's already the driver, so this seems right up his alley. At least Bentley's one mission he got at the very end of the game was along the lines of thievery as he had to hack into a computer, which feels a lot more appropriate than whacking chicken. I wish we got more stuff like that from Bentley, but better late than never. There are things that this game does that definitely feed into this theme of stealth, such as segments where you have to hide in barrels to avoid being killed by dart traps and being seen by spotlights. There's various types of lasers that set off alarms and become lethal once you trigger them, and flashlight guards patrol areas as well, and if you get spotted by them, it's practically game over since Sly can't take much damage. But you don't really have to worry about that, they're blind as hell. To give yourself more of an edge, you need to continue to collect coins sprinkled throughout the levels or by breaking objects into Beating enemies. Once you reach 100 coins, you'll receive a magically delicious lucky charm, and after receiving two lucky charms, you'll simply earn another life for every 100 coins gained from that point forward. To move forward and progress throughout the game, you need to gather a key from each level. The hubs where these levels are located act similarly to those of Spyro, where there's portals to the levels located in one big central area. Gathering three keys will allow you to surpass the first area of the hub. This typically involves using them to unlock a gate to knock out a generator, or unlocking this car that is for some reason going 75 miles per hour in reverse and nobody 
probably thought to just turn it off. Once you've collected seven total keys, you can advance to the boss of that area. Beating the bosses also allows you to steal back their page of the thing as recommend. All right, I'll stop. While the abilities you learn throughout levels up to this point are merely optional and only serve to overpower you, the capabilities you learn from the bosses pages are instrumental to the core gameplay, such as ninja spire jumps, rail walks and slides, and invisibility. The more abilities you gain makes Sly much more fun and acrobatic to play around with in these jungle gym-esque environments. With the swamps of Haiti and Krakara Volcano hosts some very slick and smooth maneuvering, along with some nice immersive music. It's not the most memorable soundtrack in the world, but like Jack and Daxter, music doesn't necessarily have to be memorable for it to be good. Diving into lower, more atmospheric tracks and hub areas, <laughs> Increasing a bit more in the majority of levels and ramping up once you enter combat. Among other featured locations are the Welsh Triangle, Utah, and China, each home to a member of the Fiendish Five, all with their own very unique backstories. Sir Raleigh the Frog, the chief machinist of the Fiendish Five, got into crime because he was very rich and got bored. Now that is storytelling, gentlemen. You've got me hard. Also, notice how the episode cards say Sly Cooper in? Even the developers know Bentley and Murray are useless. Just like most of the bosses are. Raleigh hops around, you whack him. He hops around some more, you whack him. Tornado! You whack him. <laughs> Mugshot of Utah was a bullied kid, so he decided to get jacked and beat up all those who picked on him. He's my favorite member of the Fiendish Five since he has the best overall episode, one of the better boss fights, and he's pretty funny. You're the monkey wrench in my operation? Some scrawny rat with a stick! Hey, wait a second. I seen that stick before. Maybe when my father knocked her block off with it. Sly. Your dad is dead because of him! So Mugshot's fight is all about spinning these mirrors and reflecting them off these crystals to burn him. <laughs> my beautiful gun is destroyed! <laughs> Good thing I got a spare upstairs. I died so many times in the beginning because I didn't know you could just jump over his bullets, but once I figured that out, he was boned. Get it? Because he's a dog. Ms. Ruby is the chief mystic of the Fiendish Five and was feared by others as a young pup for having the ability to summon the undead. I can't wait to see how that plays into her epic boss battle later on. In all seriousness, I actually love this fight. And I will totally admit I'm being a hypocrite because this is so wildly different from the core gameplay. It's basically a voodoo Simon says, and it gets pretty hectic towards the end with the music rapidly picking up the pace. While the PS2 version of this fight is fine, the PS3 remaster I'm playing on has the music somehow desynced with the rhythm of the buttons that you're using to dodge. <laughs> It doesn't bother me 95% of the time, but I know this issue has thrown off a lot of people. Nonetheless, this didn't ruin the fun for me. I still had a blast, just like those poor villagers that got blasted into oblivion. Next up is the panicking, who as a youthful lad was fascinated by fireworks. Trying to impress the nobleman, he instead put on an unbearable display. <laughs> Woohoo! I am on fire today! Which sent him down a path of, well... Sly said it better than I ever could. You're just a frustrated firework artist turned homicidal pyromaniac. Ah! I cannot stress enough how elementary this fight is. It is so laughably easy that Sly has proven he not only specializes in stealing from criminals, but also in stealing my time. Sly notices in the pages he'd so far recovered of the Thievius Raccoonus that a silhouette of an owl appeared in many of the different backgrounds, which leads us to the burning rock that is the Krakara Volcano, home to the mysterious fifth member of the Fiendish Five, Clockwork. After infiltrating Clockwork's mountain base, Sly finds that Carmelita has been captured and sets out to rescue her. It turns out this was a setup used to lure Sly in which then leads to Bentley hacking the system to free them from the gas chamber. From here, Carmelita and Sly have a little moment where Carmelita questions Sly's motives for freeing her. Sly simply remarks that Clockwork is the much bigger threat here and that he's never actually seen her as an enemy. Which makes sense since just a few minutes ago he said thieving wouldn't be nearly as fun without her chasing him around. They form a temporary troop. <laughs> Okay, now we escort Sly up to get his cane back, and then Sly makes a run for Carmelita's jetpack at the top of Clockwork's Tower in what is easily my favorite part of the game. And it sucks that this literally lasts like one minute, kinda like me. You swing from hooks, run on rails avoiding electric gates, smash and jump on gears, climb wires. It's so much fun putting all your skills to the test in one fast-paced tension-filled gauntlet, which leads us to the final boss. And it utilizes absolutely none of your skills learned to this 
point. You see Clockwork for the first time and he is a completely different beast from the other opponents up till now. He is an immortal mechanical owl who has been stalking the Cooper line for hundreds even thousands of years, keeping himself alive simply out of pure hatred for his family. This is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> While Clockwork fires at you, Carmelita assists you by shooting the owl with her shock pistol, granting you an opening to attack. After going down once he rises from the lava, and Sly questions him on why he didn't finish the job murdering Sly along with the rest of his family. Clockwork wanted to prove to the world that Sly was nothing without the Thievius Raccoonus, and that his family name would simply cease to exist without the book, failing to realize that it takes great thieves like Sly to create the book, rather than the book creating great thieves. This time around, Clockwork fires electric hoops you have to maneuver through while you wait once again for Carmelita to create an opening for you. After taking him down again, you navigate a field of debris until you make it to his head where you knock him senseless with your what the fuck? Knock him senseless with your thundercock and reminisce on your adventures before Carmelita steps in to give Sly that 10 second head start. Three, two, one. I felt bad leaving her stranded on that giant rock but I knew it wouldn't be long before we'd see each other again. You know, I'd say this ending's pretty cute if it weren't for the fact that Sly just handcuffed her over a fucking volcano. After beating the game, you unlock the Japanese version of the opening cutscene. And once you've restored the Thievius Raccoonus to 100%, you get a bonus ending for that as well. There's also Master Thief sprints for you to accomplish to unlock developer commentaries on each level, giving you more of an idea on their thought process as they created the game, which is really cool. But I'm not doing those sprints because I can just look up the commentaries online. On top of that, once you've done on everything there is to do, you get a behind the scenes movie and a compilation of commercials made for the game along with bloopers. All this stuff they give you is super appreciated. In short, while several mini games and even boss fights didn't fit thematically with what the game's going for with its whole stealthy rat thing, most of them controlled perfectly, so I can't knock the game too much for that. Even so, I just don't think that they utilized the whole sneaky thieving side of the game to its full potential, nor did they utilize Bentley and especially Murray to their full potential. But at the end of the day, Sly managed to stand out from the pack with its distinctive aesthetic and his heartfelt quest for revenge. The game constantly keeps things interesting, introducing new abilities for you to tinker around with, and Sly's dynamic with the rest of the cast works so amazingly well. There's much to be improved upon from Sly Cooper, but in the end, Sly still managed to rightfully steal the spotlight and firmly cement his place on the PS2 mascot map. You bust a nut. Before Crash would fall into the evil clutches of other developers, Naughty Dog would have one last run with the box bashing boy left in the tank the tank get it it's a racing game and it was a perfect tribute to the crash bandicoot franchise even going as far as to tribute the dumbass decision to play the cutscene laying out the plot after waiting around on the home screen for 30 seconds just like the first game why why anyway so this green asshole emerges from the depths of space to challenge our cast of anthropomorphic pals to a race for the fate of their planet and from here you pick from eight different characters four good and four evil <laughs> I should have picked Dingo Dial, but of course I picked Crash because I'm a basic bitch. So Aku Aku gives you the lowdown on how the hub functions. Welcome function. to the Adventure Arena. Uh, you can travel around this area and practice. Aku Aku gives you the lowdown on how the hub functions, what the map means, all that jazz. Your main objective across all the tracks is, of course, to race for first place. Obviously. And winning a certain amount of trophies in an area unlocks a race against that area's boss, with each boss, of course, coming from preceding crash titles. There's also relics, tokens, and crystals you race for, but that's not important until later on. I really like how there's no hand holding tutorial, though my dumbass probably could have used a bit of hand holding since I didn't even figure out how to use the power boost until halfway through the game. Yes, I know Aku Aku tells you how to, but I was on Discord and had the game muted, so- SHUT YOUR FUCKING MOUTH! They just send you off and give you this big open area to practice in before heading into the races. I've never really played many kart racers in my day, but I mean, these controls are as good as they can get in my book. They're for sure an INSANE <laughs> improvement over this garbage. It's so incredibly satisfying to smoothly transition from jumping and slipping and sliding and boosting around corners. There's clearly a very high ceiling for how much you can hone your skills. However, earlier on, even when I drove like a brain dead simpleton. While of course there's a difficulty curve, it never felt like I had to master these crazy moves in order to keep up. You can casually drive around or really crank up the jets and the game won't punish you here nor there or in between. 
Okay, maybe they'll give you a little spray. <laughs> Plenty of the maps are incredible, with the only one I didn't like too much being Tiny's Arena, which has more bouncing than an episode of Fake Taxi. But tracks like Dragon Mines, Papu Papu, and Hot Air Skyway each offered great fun in their own unique way. There's tracks like Sewer Speedway, Oxide Station, and Blizzard Bluff, which really grant you the luxury of zipping and sliding all over the place at addictive lightning speeds, so long as you keep timing your boost correctly. And even though it wasn't up my alley, Tiny's Arena is admittedly great for practicing those jump boosts. Maps like Cortex Castle and Polar Pass also include really cool homages to the series' previous entries, like using spiders to drop down and block the racers like the Dark Corridor levels from Crash 1, and the fact that the sky is red and rainy like Slippery Climb. Or how about how the bear from Unbearable in Crash 2 is frozen in this block of ice? Serves them right. <laughs> it's a shame they don't show the same respect to the bosses who aren't quite up to par. You call that racing? Forget about it. Who you have to defeat in order to gain keys to unlock the next group of races. Normally I go over each boss in detail when I review a game, but they all function the exact same way here. They just spam drop items until you pass them, and once you do, you've practically already won. I beat literally every single one, even Nitrous Oxide, the final boss, on my first try. Speaking of those items, there are plenty of those different power-ups to grab around the track from breaking crates. There's your explosive crates, which you drop behind you. Heat seeking missiles. Basic speed boost from turbos. Invincibility masks. Many of the different abilities can be enhanced by collecting 10 Wumpa Fruit, like TNT turning to Nitro, and a shield which is at first temporary, but once you're juiced up, lasts indefinitely until you're hit. While we're on the subject of hitting things, how about those GODDAMN TIME TRIALS, which you have to complete to race Oxide again before ridding the world of him for good. They're a great chance to learn shortcuts scattered across the map before you have to race around the tracks again, collecting the letter C, T, R. Grabbing these letters and coming in first place while doing so will unlock Gem Cup races, and for each cup you come in first for, you unlock a new player character, all of which being one of the bosses you faced previously, and the last one actually being Fate Crash, which is a really cool little easter egg. I could cry about Brio and Koala Kong being excluded from the roster, but the real crime here is including Polar and Pora, but not the Hog from Crash 1. Justice. It's a shame that Oxide isn't unlockable as well, but apparently that's due to technical limitations with the PS1, so that's droll. On the bright side, Josh Mansell delivered his bounciest, wackiest soundtrack yet. He also provides unique tracks for the hub areas, which transition together very smoothly. And when entering the final lap of a race, the music ramps up to really get the blood pumping. To my people. Something else that gets my blood pumping for all the wrong reasons, though, are these crystal challenges, where you have to race around the track gathering 20 crystals before time expires. Luckily, there's only four of them in the game, and it only took like 20 minutes to do all of them, but I was just glad to get them over with since actually racing is what I came here for. Shocking, I know. But after enduring everything the story mode has to offer, they give you a really cool ending with the whole where are they now thing for the character... Uh. Not only that, but you get a scrapbook filled with all this different concept art for the Crash games, pictures of the Naughty Dog staff, pictures of Crash being revealed at E3 1996, and more. It's really, really cool. But you're not done there, as you can also do this other time trial mode, and if you race fast enough, you get to take on the ghost of Entropy. If you can beat Entropy on every track, break out the board a limited time at Outback Steakhouse, then you unlock him as a playable character as well. And after beating him, you can race Oxide and repeating that process against him will unlock the scrapbook you just saw on the main menu. First of all, <laughs> second of all, no fucking thanks. There's other multiplayer modes to delve into, or at least there would have been if I had friends. So for now, this is the end of this review and the end of the road for Crash and Naughty Dog together. While the bosses were weak and the crystal challenges broke the pace for me personally, that's all safely disregardable. This game absolutely nails what it was meant to be good at mouth anime. To put the Wumpa on top, the nods to the other Crash games are really, really cool and a fantastic tribute from Naughty Dog to the series that put them on the map. Crash Team Racing was a perfect send-off. For the race. Jack 1 was great. At this point, however, with the Crash Trio and now the Precursor Legacy, Naughty Dog has kind of beat that style of platformer into the ground. So it'll be very interesting to see where Naughty Dog goes with a sequel. Oh, Jesus, shit, 
Well, we're jumping right into the action, aren't we? With our hero stranded in Timbuk Fuck after falling through this rift that was actually what was foreshadowed at the end of the last game. That's nice. Jack gets clocked in the dome and fast forward two years is getting juiced up with Dark Eco. Luckily, Daxter arrives to rescue his best buddy, but unfortunately, as we know, Jack isn't the best at showing his gratitude since he can't talk. I'm gonna kill Praxis! Oh, his first words. In all seriousness, this is a really great moment with Jack's first words firmly establishing how much he truly hates Baron Brown. What did you say, punk? And it's also a peek at his new rugged personality. Okay, wow, I was not ready for today. Well, at least Daxter's still ready to be a wise ass. What the heck was that? Sheesh. Remind me not to piss you off. I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, and well, that's just how this game is. The story is cranked up to 1,000, and of all the games I've played so far, has easily the most complex one, so let's break it down. Jack and Daxter have basically been transported through this portal to the distant future. But they don't know that yet. <laughs> they ask this geezer core and his brat where the hoot they are, and he informs them that they have been invited to Baron Praxis's birthday party with warm milk and cookies. Just kidding, they're gonna die. After thrashing some of the Baron's crimson guards with your new edgy powers. That was cool. Who advises that they seek out the Shadow, the leader of an underground group waging war against Haven City's Baron Praxis. The duo head off to find one of the group's lead coordinators, Torn, and he sends them off on a mission to steal Praxis's banner to prove their worth to the cause. As you'd expect, of course, everything went smoothly and according to plan. <laughs> No, seriously, he let us in. In this new installment, things have clearly undergone quite an overhaul. Between Jack's redesign, which I love, mm, tall, dark, and gruesome, and him now being able to speak, speak. I'm gonna kill Good boy. the less vibrant, more dystopian setting, which of course fits thematically with the darker plot, the techno interface accompanied by a map and mission based structure, etc. Missions have more incentive and authenticity to them now, like they have real weight and consequences. Everything you do feels like it's contributing to something and making a difference. It's all incredibly different from Jack One's more primitive, lively approach, for a lack of better term, while also remaining very familiar and feels like a completely natural progression from its predecessor. I was totally fine with how Jack One did things since the game was just so satisfying and fun to play, but brownie points go to Jack Two in this regard, because this is way better than My boy, I've got a power cell for you. In exchange, of course, for perhaps fetching your dear uncle. Uh can of Gucci. In a majority of these missions, you'll be blitzing your way through metalheads, which are these biomechanoid creatures that the Baron is at war with. Missions include restoring water to the slums, <laughs> destroying all the ammo in the Baron's fortress, etc. While on the mission to destroy all that precious ammo, the duo see some of Praxis's guards exchanging barrels of eco with metalheads, even though they're supposed to be at war. We've been we report back to Torn, and Torn orders the two to drive across town to make a delivery of eco ore to this. Well, fat fuck is about as nice as I can put it. And try to pry some information out of this guy crew as well, since he may have some inside knowledge as to what the Baron's up to. Haven City is pretty crowded to drive around. It's not horrible, but you'll definitely be accidentally bumping into other cars and pedestrians quite a bit. Granted, I was still getting used to the controls at this point since this is my first playthrough, but yeah. Hopefully driving across town doesn't happen too frequently. <laughs> Yeah, guess what? That's exactly what happens. You constantly have to drive back and forward, back and forward, and I'm sick of it! There's many, many missions where you have to drive across the entire town, which takes like two to three minutes each time. And when you take into account how many missions there are, yeah, that's a lot of time just tediously flying around. At the very least, they do include side missions for you to tackle, but, uh... Fuck you! Yeah, I personally don't really care about these side missions. For completing side missions, you get precursor orbs, which are now much rarer than they were in Jack 1. And they're used to unlock cheats, so that's pretty neat, but unfortunately, I just don't have the time to devote to that jazz. But I do have time to blow shit up! Continuing to stray away from the traditional platformer style of spins and kicks, the main method of combat has now evolved into gunplay, thanks to crew gifting us the morph gun, and I love it! What's really awesome about the morph gun is that it has four different modes, hence the name, all of which are powered by different forms of eco. The red scatter mod acts as a shotgun based on the more potent attack ability you were granted by red eco in Jack 1. The yellow blaster mod, which is inspired by the fireballs from Jack 1, acts like a semi-automatic rifle and can do this. The blue Vulcan fury mod, god that's cool name, is based on your supercharged abilities previously granted by Blue Eco, and acts like a fully automatic rifle. Finally, there's the Peacemaker, which is powered by Dark Eco, and... 
yeah, I think it speaks for itself. With the complete tone shift that the series has taken with this entry, it was necessary that Jack needed to take things up a notch from Karate. And this is perfect. You only start off with the scatter gun, but as the game progresses, the other modifications will be implemented and you'll even receive upgrades such as a faster rate of fire and more ammo. You'll receive plenty of these upgrades from crew working for him as a wastelander, which is basically someone who scavenges supplies for him beyond the city's walls. Crew is honestly one of the most captivating characters I've ever seen in like anything. His design is so memorable, all he cares about is weapons and making money since, well, he's a smuggler, weapons dealer, bar owner, crime lord, you get the gist. He just has such an aura about him to me, I I don't know, he just really piques my interest. The characters in Jack 2 as a whole are just so fucking good. And again, I already was cool with what we had in Jack 1. Before doing a job for crew in the sewers to destroy sentry guns to clear crew's old smuggling route, Jack once again demands an explanation as to why the Baron's forces are seemingly trading with metalheads. Crew angrily explains that the Baron supplies them with eco shipments so long as they attack the city just enough to keep Praxis in power, distracting the general public from the Baron's corrupt politics. However, Praxis is running short on eco and of course he needs to keep this deal going for the reasons I just mentioned. After clearing out the sewer, Crew has yet another proposition for our two heroes as he wants them to race for one of his clients. He's now I've already aged 15 years driving back and forth across this city. Also, I have to mention this game is so funny. I love its humor so much. I've uh, already he signed your name to save time. We the racers hereby agree to give crew all proceeds from race earnings, endorsement fees, broadcast royalties, syndication residuals, vehicle sponsorships, small appearance fees, collectible card assets, fast food tie-ins, use of likeness rights, talk show deals, clothing lines, all print rights. Anyway, that client just so happens to be former love interest Kira, who doesn't recognize Jack's voice because, well, he's never talked. She tells you to fuck off and do some flips, and then she's like, fine, I'll help you, you stupid elf, and points you in the direction of where to turn on an elevator to get to the Baron's palace. The duo rescue this scientist Vin from under Metalhead Siege and Daxter just loves triggering his PTSD from it. <laughs> After doing some other crap, they ask him to turn on that elevator's power. And we're all set now, so let's see. The elevator is up and to the left. Okay, got it. The elevator leads straight up to the very top of the city, accompanied by a bit of classic platforming. You reach the roof of the palace and eavesdrop on the Baron and the Metalhead leader, continuing their fallout due to no eco supply on the Baron's end. And that bonehead Daxter almost blows their cover, but luckily they're not spotted and never mind, our cover's blown. Unlike the bosses from Jack 1, which were pretty decent, these bosses will completely blow you to bits. The Baron uses what I like to think is this Cthulhu inspired mech, but the wiki weakly refers to it as a squid mech. How boring is that? He starts off with some high rate of fire lasers, which sent me into a bit of a panic at first, but wasn't all bad once I got the hang of it. Next round, he shoots blue eco rockets, which are actually pretty easy to evade. And in the third round of the fight, he fires off red eco tornadoes and absolutely bulldozes you. Once he uses up all his ammo, he has to recharge, which is another opening to attack. And once you get a third of his health down, he'll spiral out of control. And if you let your guard down, it'll definitely cost you. He also has about a 5 second invincibility buff after each bit of damage he receives, but no, we don't get that, this game has to be hard! Pull that all together and you've got a really great, challenging boss battle with an amazing soundtrack to boot. Speaking of the music, one thing that's cool as well is when you pull out the morph gun, the music alters slightly. The game also does this when you hijack a hover car or use your hoverboard, and yeah, I just love little attention to detail like this. On the flip side to that, while I assume this is just an issue with the HD collection, there were quite a few times, mostly towards the end of the game, where the music just cuts out. Oh yes, I'm really getting the adrenaline rush I need to mud stomp this asshole. And from here on out, your asshole is gonna be getting mud stomped, because this game is the literal definition of difficulty spike. There's this mission at the water slums where you have to get this piece of a seal for a lurker because they're good guys now, lol. <laughs> and you get ambushed by Crimson Guards. I got stuck on this for an hour. Or how about this mission where you have to escort other members of the underground in new safe houses because you cause too much of a ruckus at the Baron's Palace and you're getting your shit kicked in by Crimson Cars the whole time. The guys are pussies who just die from love taps and you die just from trying to park your car. Even this mission, which is way harder than it probably should have been. I mean, just look at my nose where you have to destroy this equipment using your jet board at the Baron's excavation site while guards are equipped with China Lakes and your jet board won't attach to the fucking wheel. Not to mention 
the checkpoints can be unforgiving. I just got set back like seven minutes after escorting these dumb snotty losers through the stinky sewer. They're not even helpful. Like, you're useless. Let's talk about someone much less useless. That person being Ashlyn, the daughter of the Baron. Corn sent us out to look for her at the pumping station, and she suggests that you ask the old soothsayer Onan and her interpreter Pecker about artifacts related to Mar. Mar being the legendary precursor founder of Haven City. She goes on to inform you of the tomb of Mar, which is home to the precursor stone, and the stone is the key to defeating the metalheads once and for all. Onan says they need to retrieve not two, not four. Three. Artifacts from the Precursor Mountain Temple outside the city. The Mountain Temple is one of the only places in the game which seems mostly untouched by civilization, with it and Haven Forest being the only places really reminiscent of the more natural environments from Jack 1. It's a really, really cool setting with some fun puzzle segments to mix things up. And it's nice to take a step back from all the chaos we've endured so far and ease into something a bit more back to basics, even though these guys are assholes. Then the game continues to cram me into my duffel after Torn sends the pair out to protect the sacred site, and they realize that said site is actually Samus's hut, which is now completely overgrown, and the two realize that they're in the future. Well, the future, who would have thought that? After returning to the hideout, we finally meet the Shadow, who is actually a young Samos. And he informs us that the kid we've seen throughout the game with Kor is actually an heir to the throne of Mar, meaning he is the only one who can open the tomb of Mar to get the precursor stone. We take the young laddie to the tomb after recovering all the other necessary supplies to access the tomb's entrance, but an oracle informs us that he's too much of a wuss to take on the obstacles that lie inside, so Jack goes in instead. After traversing all of the tomb's trials like more puzzles and even a throwback to the chasing days of Crash Bandicoot, Baron Praxis re-emerges in an attempt to retrieve the stone and so we have to whoop his hiney again. He sends these bots after you and then shoots these bombs which you have to whack back towards him. In the final third of the fight, he actually gets a hold of the stone and harnesses its power to destroy the platform around you. And he also sometimes gets all close and personal, firing quickly at you and destroying the pillars which act as shields for you. Not as good as the first fight, but still pretty enjoyable. Praxis escapes with the stone, and Torn confesses that he had to sell out the underground to protect Ashlyn, as Praxis threatened to kill her for treason since she had been working as an underground spy. After rescuing our rebellious buddies from the fortress where Jack was formerly imprisoned, we're reunited with our Samos. And he he instructs us to find the life seed from his hut, which will grant the younger Samus the same sagely power as his older counterpart. Jack and Daxter deliver the seed to Samus Jr., and he uses it to talk with the plants or some shit about what will happen in the future. And the plants reveal to him that the Baron plans to break the stone, releasing his power in an attempt to rid the world of metalheads for good. Which, you know, works all fine and dandy, because it would also destroy the entire world. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kira has been secretly working on a replica of the same Rift Rider that sent them to this time period to get them back to their native timeline, though she still needs the time and the heart of Mar, and the latter of which is in Crew's possession. That fuck probably ate it already. But no time for that now, as it's time for the championship race against this prick who's been simping our girl and apparently <laughs> us too. Ooh. But we pulverize his arse with ease, winning ourselves the tour of Praxis's palace. Of course, Praxis recognizes us, but definitely not fast enough, because he had no clue who we were at first. I mean, crikey, you've tried killing Jack twice, and before that, Jack was your dark warrior experiment for two years, dumbass. He sends his goons on a headhunt for us, but not before Arrow fucking dies. The guards kill us and then everything's fine. Like nothing ever happened. Also, I know I haven't said anything really about the races up to this point, even though there's been like three of them before this. They're fine, you boost, you drive, it controls fine, so yeah. I'd much rather talk about how fast this woman.png in the crowd is clapping. Or how fast this dumb broad was convinced. Jack tells her, You did, we're gonna die if your dickhead dad cracks open that stone! And she's like, Nah, man, quit busting my stones, we're all good. Then she calls Vin for proof, and he's like, And then she's like, Oh. Never mind, go kill that two-ton tub of fun who's planning to crack open the stone. Tensions have been slowly boiling between the boys and the behemoth boy pretty much ever since we met crew. And it was made especially obvious that they were going to come to blows eventually when Jack refused to throw in the championship race for him. Crew tries to bribe Jack with one last gun upgrade to simply walk away and forget that we saw him building a bomb to break open the precursor stone, but Jack's not buying it. So now it's time to throw down against these electrified crew clones. Let me introduce you to my crew. Shut the fuck up. I'd advise staying as far back as possible here and fending them off with your your scatter gun until you clear the waves of them. After that, crew will come in for the kill, but you should be able to fight him off very easily with either the blaster or Vulcan Fury. This took me a couple tries, but that's really only because I hadn't formulated the scatter strategy up to that point. And once I did, that made this fight fairly easy. But it was still a ton of fun. Fat fuck! Crew activates the bomb he built to break the stone in a last ditch effort to do us in, but Ashlyn is there for the save, and we made it off with the Heart of Mar as well. Then we have to do whack-a-mole because why not? And beating the minigame grants us the time map from inside the machine. 
machine that crew was hiding away. But now we have to rescue fellow wastelander Sig after crew sent him on a mission to the underport to open a passage for the metalheads to infiltrate the city, which of course Sig didn't know that's what he was actually doing. After doing a couple more puzzle segments and being chased by this giant metalhead, we finally lose him and... Oh no. He's doing the heroic speech thing heroes do before they die. You know that thing where they're like, yup, we are gonna kill him? We're gonna shoot him up dead. Nothing can stop us! <laughs> yup. No way, pal. No sir. We're gonna... I'm gonna fuck him up good, and he's dead. And soon enough, all these people may be dead, because as we re-emerge to the surface, we see metalheads have completely taken over the streets of Haven City in a full-scale attack. We meet with the others outside the racing stadium, and help escort the now fully constructed Rift Rider to the Metalhead Nest. And then we finally meet the Metalhead leader, who turns out to be Kor. The Baron leads a charge against him, and fails hilariously. The city must die, and we all die! Ah! Hey, at least he left me with a nice quote for me to hang on my wall. Finally, with the precursor stone in hand, after retrieving it from that other bomb Praxis had conjured up, we invade the Metalhead Nest. And now, everything is finally starting to come together. With the boy by his side, Kor explains that the boy is actually a younger Jack, and the Jack we know now actually began his journey in the future, where we're at now. So, technically, the precursor legacy actually takes place in the past. And this game takes place in the present? Honey, the more you think about it, the more it hurts the head. Yeah, thank you, Daxter. That sums up my feelings perfectly. The foreshadowing in this game is on point, though, between Kor's eventual reveal as the Metalhead leader. Baron is bribing the Metalheads with Eco! <laughs> it will never be enough. And the boy being revealed as Jack. Find yourself, Jack! <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> Interesting. That insufferable mutt never liked anyone but the boy before. I guess I'm just good with animals. The reason the younger Jack is so vital is because he possesses the gift to release the precursor entities from inside the stone. Our Jack doesn't because the dark eco injections over the years have corrupted him. Basically, the stone is actually a precursor egg. The last one, in fact. And Kor wants to feed on this final precursor life force. Kor blasts the edge they're standing on to try and knock the stone away from them. And none other than Dark Jack emerges from the rubble. I'm here for this. Let's fucking go. Oh. I was really hype. I thought we were gonna get straight up Dark Jack vs. Core, but... Dark Jack is really cool. I wish they did more with him. I mean, the opening cutscene establishes this new freaky power. And shortly after, Jack bursts into it again, going on about how he can't control it. But after that, it's almost like the game forgot about its place in the story, or that it even existed to begin with. Sure, you can upgrade your dark powers using metalhead skulls, but that's really as relevant as the power-up becomes. But man, doing this is so fucking cool. No worries though, my disappointment was quickly subsided by what is a fantastic final fight. You've got these metalhead scorpion looking things scampering and all over as Kor charges up some blasts. Once you deal a third of his health, metalheads emerge from the hole below him with jetpacks and after schooling them and thumping Kor some more, he decides it's time to stop messing around and make his way to the ground. That rhymed. This is where things kept getting very intense for me, cause by the time I reached this phase of the fight, I was usually very low on ammo. So I'd have to quickly fetch some more from around the arena while he's in hot pursuit of my anus which was always super nail biting. Once you're stocked up, he's not too bad, but the tension is real, you should already be dead! At long last! The war with the metalheads is over and a precursor emerges from the egg before leaving through the rift Using the rider the gang sends the younger Jack and Seamus back to the precursor legacy timeline While our current crop of heroes rejoice at Crew's old bar, which has now become the naughty Otzel But the best part is my man Sig returning from the brink of death <laughs> And that was the absolute roller coaster known as Jack 2 good God, my head hurts. This game grabs you by the balls and really reels you in to begin the adventure. Jack opens up with a badass line. He can transform. And let's not forget you've just been thrusted who knows how many years into the future or past or fuck. I love the morph gun and the way they incorporated the different types of eco into it. The bosses were amazing. The music has some gems when it actually played. The characters are incredibly captivating. The game was making me laugh over and over and over again and overall just some how very naturally progresses from the country setting, as Daxter calls it, to a more gritty dystopian city. Hell, I even relish the challenge of the massive difficulty jump this game takes from its predecessor, because figuring out the correct strategy to approach enemies is so satisfying. What left me unsatisfied, however, which I just mentioned a moment ago, is the fact that Dark Jack doesn't play much of a role in the bigger picture. 
There's also a mech and it sucks dick. As you play through this game, you'll probably have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it due to the tedious driving around the map, how difficult it can get at times, and the gripes I just mentioned. But the more I find myself dwelling on the adventure now that it's all said and done, the more I just absolutely love it. Jack 2 was an outstanding over- Hey guys, wait your turn! Your video's up next! No, no. Why is Billy sad? Is he cold? Hungry? Or maybe just... Oh no! No, 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 take it away! Lonely. No! Ratchet and Clank exploded onto the scene in 2002 and was quickly approved for a sequel, five months before the game was even released because of how confident Sony was that the duo would succeed. I mean, with the game jam-packed with, well, fucking jams, a mouth-watering presentation from its vast detailed worlds and even interfaces, a golden cast of characters supporting a simple yet compelling story, and some good weapons. But that's what Ratchet and Clank walking around with no underwear is here to fix, the things that fucking sucked. Yes, you read that correctly, this game is actually called Going Commando, and this entry into the series began a long-running gag of sexually insinuating titles. Ratchet and Clank, up your arsenal. <laughs> Quest for booty. Size matters. What a ridiculous title. Size matters? Everybody knows that's just a myth. I mean, honestly, who really cares about how big or small or stupid fuck? Well, enough foreplay, let's jump right into the action. The game begins of Ratchet and Clank as they're being interviewed for a show known as Behind the Hero. But before we get to that, you guys know how much I love the opening menu in the last game, and this one's great too, with the two playing their game from last year. Never change, Ratchet, you narcissistic asshole. The duo explain more or less that they've been doing jack shit since Shrek was defeated, and Ratchet wishes that somebody could use a hero right now. Um, I'm sorry. What? In that moment, Abercrombie Fizzwidget kidnaps the two, transporting them to the Bogon Galaxy, and Ratchet fittingly looks both ecstatic and terrified. <laughs> Fizzwidget explains that his company Megacorp, which is like the gadgetron of this game, has had their top secret biological experiment stolen from their testing... bathroom. By this dupliferous criminal mastermind. And he needs the duo to get it back. Interestingly enough, Clank is the one reluctant to embark on this new venture, while Ratchet again shows he is the one eager to jump into action and be the hero, which is a complete role reversal of the two in the last game. This is because the developers found Ratchet's snarky, selfish attitude from the last game too antagonistic, so they wanted to redeem the character by making him more friendly, selfless, and less irritable. Way to go, Clank! <laughs> Nothing to it. You did great. Now, let's go get that experiment back. As you can hear, this also led to James Arnold Taylor being brought in as the new voice actor for the character, who fits this more mature Ratchet much better than Mikey Kelly would have. Sorry, Mikey Kelly, I know you're definitely watching this and I don't want to hurt your feelings. Fizz Widget takes no hard feelings towards Crank's hesitance to join the mission, as he precipitated he would feel this way. He offers Clark the job as head accountant of Megacorp, offers him a penthouse in Megapolis, and a robotic masseuse, which I'm pretty sure just gave Clank a boner. I didn't need to see that. After Ratchet's various preparations for the perilous mission, including martial arts, heavy weaponry, and ballroom dance, Ratchet is sent off to a flying base where the thief is currently located, where he will steal the experiment back. Right off the bat, you can feel how much tighter the game controls. It only took five years, but Insomniac finally figured out how to fucking turn properly. Not only that, but Insomniac also added a proper strafing ability, instantly making the combat 10 times smoother and 10 times the fun. The weapons also feel 10 times more powerful. No more bomb gloves thrown together with scrap metal and pop rocks. Now we've got fucking mini nukes. As great as the mini nuke is, who needs that when you've got the bouncer? A bomb which explodes and unleashes more mini bombs. Or how about the mega rocket tube, which can even charge up to four rockets at a time? Or my personal favorite, the plasma storm, which fires a storm of plasma that zaps the life out of anything that stands in its way. The drone device in Ratchet 1 was a game changer, but this game has something even better than that, the kilonoids. Pair that with the shield charger, which makes you invincible until it gets deactivated, and you'll be an absolute force of nature. On top of the weapon simply feeling more powerful and impressive to wield, they become more powerful over time as well. I'm Another new combat feature is this experience bar into most of the Megacorp weapons. I specifically say Megacorp because you can actually obtain some of the Gadgetron weapons from Ratchet 1, but unfortunately they're not upgradable until New Game Plus. Fortunately to make up for that, you can get any of the ones you bought in Ratchet 1 for free as long as the save file is intact. 
Um, uh, oh, oh, there we go. Anyways, once you fill that experience bar all the way up, your weapon will undergo an upgrade, amplifying its power and sometimes its ammo capacity. Although the heavy lancer is just complete dog shit, Jesus fucking Christ. To make that shit stank a bit less, there are also weapon mods which can be purchased with platinum bolts. Yes, regular bolts are now gold, and the secret bolts you find scattered around the levels are platinum. All right. You can purchase these modifications from Slim Cognito, who provides ship upgrades as well. Weapon mods include a shock mod which will electrocute the enemy you shoot, as well as shock others in the vicinity, an acid mod which poisons the enemy slowly over time, and a lock-on mod which locks on, obviously, and even shows the enemy's health. As I mentioned a moment ago, you can also purchase ship upgrades. However, you don't buy these with platinum bolts, you buy them with rare titanium, which you will primarily pick up during space battles. The space battles seem to be some of the more not-so-well-received sections of the game, but honestly, I think they're pretty cool. Most most of them are pretty harmless and don't overstay their welcome. Ship upgrades include stronger boosts, stronger shields, faster lock-on for your missiles, and more. There's even aesthetic upgrades you can make in the form of new wings for your ship and paint jobs, and the more skill points you gain, which are earned by doing random shit, the more paint jobs are made available to you. Jack's Black Heart is always my go-to, I mean look at it, I just wanna munch it out. But the upgrades don't stop there because even your health receives more frequent upgrades. In Ratchet 1, you were basically stuck with 4 health points the whole game, but you could purchase premium and ultra nanotech, which would increase your health from 4 to 5, and finally to 8. Here though, your health experience just climbs up and up from defeating enemies, and so you're fully charged up and you explode like a spirit bomb, receiving more health, restoring your health, and killing everything in sight. Incoming! You can also get nanotech upgrades by finding nanotech containers lying around in some of the levels, and there's even two types of nanotech now. Blue restores one point of health, while purple restores four. To preserve all that new precious health you're gaining, the game also implements armor vendors, but I don't buy armor sets because I'm better than all of you. Except this one. It's cool as fuck. <laughs> Nitpick incoming, so the weakest set of armor is introduced halfway through the game, about 10 levels in. Then the next set is only introduced 3 levels after that. The next is practically 1 level after that. And then the last one is introduced like 2 levels after that. With 4 armor sets to go around, why didn't they just release a new set every 5 levels? Can't you idiots do anything right? Yes, they can actually. In fact, they even fixed the bolt grinding problem where you now gain bolts at a competent speed. And there are more ways to collect bolts rather than exploiting a glitch. After completing the mandatory dogfights, you can do extra missions for more bolts. They're all really easy and only take a couple minutes, so I think they are most definitely worth your time. You can also gain bolts from doing battle in either of the two Megacorp Gladiator arenas. Some challenges include using only your wrench in combat, not being allowed to take damage, <laughs> And even the impossible challenge for 200,000 bolts, which lasts who knows how long 60 rounds. Of course, the arenas are a great way to build up that experience bar for your weapons as well, as are the deserts, where you can also gather crystals and moonstones for more bolts and even find more rare titanium to upgrade your ship. Fun fact, this ice level by the name of Grelbin you're seeing, which is like notoriously the worst level in the game, though I personally love it because I'm a masochist for this shit, was made in three days. Three days! I almost forgot to mention that there are hover bike races now, which are another way to get more bolts. These are better than the hoverboard races from the last game in my opinion, but are still way too easy to be enjoyable. It's just mindlessly holding R1 and steering. You can also win a new type of boot by doing one of them though, which allow you to quickly boost forward. <laughs> As you can see, there are countless ways to keep reeling in the dough, upgrading your ship, your weapons, your health, your armor, while winning gadgets and items is just this constant revolving door of dopamine! What's not as dope is the return of the clank sections, which are admittedly made much better by introducing more bots for you to work with, and the fact that you don't have to walk to High Hrothgar every time your microbots die. The new bots introduced are bridge bots, hammer bots, and lift bots. Bridge bots build bridges for you. The hammer bots hammer things for you. And the lift bots lift wow. things for you. <laughs> Speaking of the stars, you take off to them in the form of giant clank making his return, who takes on a couple of bosses, but we'll swing back around to them. While we're on the topic of swinging, let's talk about some of these gadgets. Man, I am truly the king of segways. Our buddy old pal the swing shot makes its glorious return, but we've also got a new cast of tech to tinker with. The dynamo activates holograms and machinery by zapping these triggers. It makes for some pretty cool platforming challenges. There's also the tractor beam, which unfortunately doesn't spawn a beam of tractors and only moves pillars and this thing. Next up is the Therminator, which you use to freeze and unfreeze pools. It does genuinely get some pretty clever uses, so... 
that's cool. After that, we have the Hypnomatic, and it's a shame it got introduced so late in the game because I think it really does have some potential. Basically, you can use it to hijack these little robots, and the robots can hijack other robots. I wish it had more time to develop. Next up is the Electrolyzer, which you win from the first Mega Corp Arena, and it's like the trespasser of this game. All you have to do is flick these switches in time to make sure you're not blocking off these trails of light. I think it fits the overall faster pace of the game better than something like the trespasser would have, but I do also miss the more methodical, thought provoking puzzle segments of Ratchet 1. But like I just said, this fits the game better anyway, so I should shut my pie hole. You get another lockpicking gadget of sorts known as the Infiltrator from the second Gladiator Arena, and it's pretty crap. You mindlessly go off another direction trying to figure your way around this maze like ball to link all these circuits together, and it's just not fun. There's barely any brain power you have to put behind it, you just jam the analog stick in a bunch of directions until you get it right. On the bright side, the Epic Gamer boots from the last game, the Grind Boots and newly dubbed Gravity Boots return, and the Gravity Boots are used mainly for some pretty cool arena battles, so that is nice. The music continues to be a nice highlight as well, although I do find this soundtrack to be slightly weaker than Ratchet 1's. The bosses, however, are quite weaker than Ratchet 1's, and that's saying a lot because Ratchet 1's weren't all that great either. With the exception of two optional bosses here, they are all complete shit. Let's talk about all the optional ones first, and then I'll delve into the story and talk about the main ones. So the first Mega Corp Arena is home to Chain Blade. And the B2 Brawler. 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 Chain Blade fucking simple. I mean, come on, dude. I'm exposing you on YouTube right now. B2 Brawler, however, is actually pretty tough. He fires these beams at you and then pulls a Booker T and goes for the Spinneroonie, which always hits me at least once every time he does it. Pretty solid stuff. In the second Mega Corp Arena, you take on the Arachnoid. <laughs> That was easy. Then there's Megapede, who flies around the arena, and you have to shoot down segments of his body, which are equipped with turrets, and will start shooting at you, while the main Megapede also sends down these homing bombs. This one's pretty decent, but I have to say, it is pretty cool to see the inspiration drawn from the battle with the dragons in Spyro 3. So after completing the second Megacorp arena, you also win the gravity boots, which you can then use to backtrack to the second level in the game. Go up this ramp, slide down this tube, and holy shit. The swamp monster is fairly durable, and you constantly have to be shifting from one little pads in the next in an attempt to keep some distance. Easily its most dangerous form of attack though is when it relentlessly charges forward trying to eat you. This is a pretty solid fight. Beating him will grant you the box breaker which will allow you to simply slam your wrench and destroy any breakable objects in the area for bolts. You can also use the tractor beam to reach the secret area on another planet where you can trade for the armor magnetizer off this quark fanboy with a quark action figure that you buy off the returning plumber. See you in another year or so. What did he mean by that? The magnetizer as I'm sure you figured out, brings far away bolts to you. The final optional boss battle is against an alien mothership for the map Omatic, which will reveal secret areas and the location of platinum bolts, crystals, and moonstones on the map. And maybe those nanotech things I was talking about? I didn't really look into that. Nothing too complex about this one, it's just a brawl, but it is fairly challenging. And that was Ratchet and Clank going commando. Fine, fine, we'll talk about the rest of the fucking bosses. After failing to recapture the experiment, Ratchet is chased off the ship by enemies he's already killed 30 times up to this point. Ratchet explores the swamp planet Shinonuma, but finds no clues on the thief's whereabouts. However, this is where we encounter our first boss of the game, but I'm not going to give any shit to it because it's more of a strafing tutorial than anything. All I will say, though, is when your tutorial is harder than nearly all the actual bosses... That's bad. After winning the Electrolyzer at the Maktar Resort, we find out that the thief has kidnapped Clank, and we set out to rescue him. I don't really get what the point of separating these two in the beginning of the game was if you were just gonna reunite them so quickly, but... Whatever. On another path of the same planet, we encounter our first real boss fight against the Thugs for Less leader. I just threw up air quotes when I said real boss fight because as you can see, this was easy as fuck. Thugs for Less is a gang of mercenaries hired by the thief to keep us off his hiney. And their leader is an absolute lovable idiot. Ahem. Next, our space rendezvous point has been moved to, and listen up knuckleheads, the Felsen system in sector one, two, three, four, five. If you're no good with numbers, find a buddy to help you. Yes, yes, just like the last game, this one made me cackle hard. You idiot. <gasps> Uh-oh. I'm paying top dollar for your protection, and your moron employees are off at some... Hey, that was a bonding exercise. We do some races, some space battles, infiltrate a factory, and then we finally track down the thief for realsies and begin to fight him on top of these trucks, which is a really cool set piece. The trucks fall over and stop very suddenly. That is not how physics work. Ratchet should be dead. But he might die now in what is sure to be a climactic boss battle. That was even shorter than the last!
best one. That's what she said. <laughs> uh, whatever. We got the fucking furball. Now we have to get it back to Mr. Fizzlefuck on this desert planet. This cutscene you're about to see, by the way, is easily my favorite in the game. When we first arrived, we found a planet completely overrun by rainforest. To better accommodate the local wildlife, we transformed this impassable jungle into an easily navigable desert. Ever the technological pioneer, Megacorp invented the automated management team, thereby eliminating costly upward mobility. And all the while, making your life richer. Drek was the clear-cut villain of Ratchet 1. Up to this point, the thief has been positioned that way, but really was never as malicious and threatening as Drek, and for good reason. We've been gunning to get this experiment back to Mr. Fizzwidget, who as I said earlier is the leader of Megacorp. And if you didn't notice up until now, this video package of the mining site you're heading to makes sure you know that Megacorp is the true enemy of the whole game. Once again, it is made blatantly clear to us, all anybody in this universe cares about is making money. And unbeknownst to Ratchet and Clank, by returning the experiment to Fizzwidget, they are playing right into the hands of the enemy, who is much closer than they think. Nonetheless, the two return the experiment to him, and he accidentally ejects them from his ship, sending them crashing below the desert surface. Again, more role reversals at play here. If this were the first game, Clank would be trying to calm Ratchet down, and Ratchet would probably just opt to snap Clank in half over his knee. We almost make our way out of the cave completely before being halted right in our tracks by the thief who demands we hand over the experiment. The bozo falls over, revealing he is a she, and warns the two that they just put the galaxy in grave danger by returning the experiment to Fizzledorf. The two gather crystals for this sage so he can repair their ship that Fizzwidget crushed when they first landed, and head off for the planet Dabo, home of the Megacorp testing facility. The duo find the girl Angela's suspicions to be true as they find a video of the experiment, which is soon named the Protopet, attacking its handlers, with employees calling for the experiment to be terminated. Speaking of terminated, so was Thugs for Less's contract with Angela in favor of protecting Mr. Fizzwidget because he seems to be going... nuts. Huh? 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 Fuck you, that was good. Also, you fight the thug leader on this moon above the planet as Giant Clank, and it's... whatever, man. Can you tell I can't be bothered to talk about how bleh most of these fights are? <laughs> then Ratchet and Clank get a DUI. Uh, how are you still alive? And are sent back to where the game started, the Thugs for Less prison. They break out of the Thugs prison pretty easily, and go off to save Angela who's been captured by the Thug leader, which leads into the worst boss battle of the game. I never look forward to this boss battle because it's so goddamn long. That's what she said! <laughs> as much as I hate how short the other bosses are, at least they're quick and painless, whereas this takes like 10 minutes. It's such a downer, especially after all the fast paced gunning you had to do to get here. You just use turrets to shoot these bombs out of the sky over and 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 over. I'm bored. I'm leaving. After rescuing Angela, she shows you a transmission from the thug leader, where you can see thousands and thousands of crates filled with rabid proto-pets ready to be shipped across the galaxy. We pull off some more heists before it's time to invade Megacorp HQ, where the original proto-pet can be found. The original proto-pet is being used to produce all the other proto-pets, so if the gang can take out the original, it'll shut all the others down. Oh, uh, yeah, by the way. Uh, so Angela was a former Megacorp employee and she has like her own ID card and that's how she can get into the headquarters and that's how she just knows about everything that's going on. So yeah, should have filled you guys in about that earlier. I have to say the last few levels of this game especially are really strong. Planet Smog, home to the Megacorp's distribution center, is this ominous floating factory. It looks absolutely incredible, especially using your levitator, which is a gadget I forgot to mention. Then there's the barbaric but beautiful ice plains of Grelbin, accompanied by some fantastic music, fucking yetis, and leviathans, which are cool as hell. I know I'm very lonely in the fact that Grelbin is one of my favorites, and I totally understand why people would hate it, but I'm an idiot. I love Grelbin, even if it is very, very hard. <laughs> the harrowing Thugs for Less HQ on Snivelac is amazing. And then there's of course the menacing Megacorp HQ on <laughs> After laying the smack down, you make your way to the Protopet testing room, and you're suddenly stopped by Abercunty, who kills Clank's girlfriend. Yes, that was a thing too, but I didn't mention it because it's hardly important. Then Fizz figures, fuck just going, Commando. I'm going the whole nine yards. Oh my god. Yes, that's right, children. Markiplier makes his return. I mean, it was pretty obvious, but 
shut up. I have to be dramatic for the script. Throughout the game, you're shown these other behind the hero packages of Captain Quark and his downfall from the greatest superhero in the Solana galaxy to a complete nobody who seemingly vanished from existence. After escaping in prison, of course. What I love about this twist so much is that he has been Fizzwidget the entire game. But the thing is, Fizzwidget has such a big vocabulary, so throughout the game, Quark tried emulating that by either slapping together entirely new words or just using words in the completely incorrect context. I repeat, it eats its handlers. Ah, yes. Uh, low fat, extra foam, no sprinkles. Mr. Fizzwidget, do you copy? Anyone handling the experiment must exercise the utmost caution. No, no. Decapitated. But you might be wondering why did Quark impersonate Fizzwidget in the first place? So obviously the protopet has been shown to be defective. By impersonating Fizzwidget, Quark was able to push up the release date of the experiments, putting the entire Bogon galaxy in imminent danger, setting himself up to be the hero by framing our three heroes, and saving everyone from this threat by himself. This of course blows up in his face when he uses this helix so Thingy. to try and revert the protopet from its current hostile state, but instead mutates it, making it swell up in size, and then it proceeds to eat him. Now it's time to get the Helixo thingy back to try things from square one in what is, of course, a quite disappointing final boss. Now that that's over with, the real Fizzwidget is back. Open Turns out he'd been tied up in a supply closet this whole time. Quark gets barfed up along with the Helixo Jazz, which reverts the protopet back to being a good boy. Meanwhile, Clank gets sad seeing his lady partner in pieces and Ratchet promises to fix her. I actually thought that was a really cool little parallel to the ending of the first game. The next we see of Quark is him working as a test dummy for Megacorp's crotchetizer, and I'm sure you can imagine how that went. <laughs> And if you saw my review of Ratchet 1, go check it out. You'd know we're not done yet. No, sir, it's time for challenge mode. In challenge mode, instead of gold weapons like last time, you can now buy mega weapons, which will upgrade into ultra weapons. You also get a bolt multiplier, so the more enemies you kill without taking damage, the faster you'll gain bolts, and the multiplier can reach as high as 20 times. Not only that, but there's plenty of extras for you to scope out, such as paintings, a sketchbook full of concept art and other stuff, parody commercials, a making of video, and whatever this is, and you can even access the Insomniac Museum, which is full of cool cut content from the game, such as water nipples. And well, that's Ratchet and Clank 2. It's a shame the bosses were absolute dickhole, because outside of them, I really only have nitpicks. The infiltrator fucking sucks, the races are kind of boring, and it didn't really make sense to separate Ratchet and Clank if they were just going to be reunited so quickly. And you could make the argument that Clank's reluctance to save the galaxy goes against his character. Oh, and of course, port issues, where you see stuff outside the normal 4x3 ratio the game was upscaled from. Other than that, Wow, what a game. The combat's immensely improved from the technical aspect and is just made way more interesting from the weapon upgrades and the mods and the overall better roster of weapons. The arenas are great, the deserts are great, the new health system is great, the armor is great, the characters are as enthralling as ever, the story's got more layers to it, the cutscenes are fantastic, the music is still fantastic, the ship segments are good enough, Giant Clank is cool, Ratchet's not a turd, I mean, what else can I really say? This was a stellar sequel. <laughs> Will you get out of here? I just talked about you. And I forgot to talk about the glider too. God, I suck! You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. <laughs> Sly Cooper had quite the debut with Simon Says and Meat Beating. Don't get me wrong, it was a great game, but for a game about a master thief, you sure didn't feel like a thief at times. What the hell is even that? I mean, Bentley and Murray didn't even feel like thieves in the last game at all when they were supposed to be part of your band. <laughs> Luckily, Sucker Punch starts things off strong, addressing my concerns with an opening, dripping, sneaky atmosphere. As our adventure kicks off with Peking Duck and Blizzard breaking into the Cairo Museum of Natural History to steal the clockwork parts. Because surprise, surprise, he's still alive! Kind of. And what do you know? Within two minutes, Bentley already proves to be more useful than he was in almost all of Sly 1. Speaking of being useless, where's Murray? Well, that's one hell of a meteoropic entrance, immediately presenting Murray as the new destructive force of the gang. A bit of a sudden change, but I'd rather this than him be a big pink pussy. With the help of Bentley and Murray, thanks guys, you can go back to hiding in the van for the rest of your miserable lives. You bust into this big open room with no clockwork parts to be found. Oh, sh Freeze, Cooper. Inspector Fox. Wait, what? As beautiful and unpredictable as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable. Carmelita, you you're sounding quite... The of the crime. American. And so begins the trend of Carmelita getting a new voice actor every fucking game. No! 
I really don't understand why they changed it all the time. Her voice was fine in the first game. I think she just needed more time to adjust to the role. Also, Sly and Carmelita's banter is back, and it's just as lovely as ever. Whereas you crooks are so predictable, you always return to the scene of the crime. Crime? I haven't stolen anything. Yet. The character interactions throughout the game are fantastic, and Murray was so funny to me throughout the duration. Little details from how close he is to the Binocucom, come on Murray, that's not social distancing. So the lines he's given and the way he delivers them always makes me chuckle. This is going to be a tough job that requires both our skills. My skills? Okay, Bentley. If you say so. Anyway, Carmelita is not alone as she's packing Constable Nilo alongside her, who alludes to the fact that the clockwork parts being missing could be a Claw Gang job, which is a better name than the Fiendish Five, I guess. Wait, Claw Gang is with a K and two Ws? Now that's cool! Things get more epic as Nila perhaps inadvertently distracts Carmelita long enough for the boys to make another getaway, but goddamn, how the hell does she still have a job shooting like that? We get our first cutscene of the game, recapping Sly's origins, and also speculating Nila may be purposely name dropping the Claw Gang? As you can probably see with the eyeballs, the cutscenes jack up in quality, fully embracing and refining the comic book approach they went for in Sly 1. The style just has such a pop and oomph to it. <sighs> it's such a fantastic start. I don't know what's in my future, but I won't let it be a repeat of my past. Can I just say that is genuinely one of the most motivational quotes I've ever heard? Ah. Perfect. After that, we're greeted with an episode menu acting as a level select screen accompanied by some freeform jazz. <laughs> Peter McConnell is brought in as the new series composer, and he captures the atmosphere the game goes for brilliantly, with nice, smooth, subdued tracks, but also knows when to ramp things up when shit hits the fan, which sometimes sounds like incest intensifying. I really liked, uh, I'm gonna butcher this, Ashif Hakik's work in Sly 1, but McConnell, I feel, is just a better fit for here and the rest of the series, but they're both fantastic in their own right. What's also fantastic are the new hub worlds each episode takes place in. It's no longer one small central area branching off into separate levels, no, this entire area is the level, and there's plenty of ways to keep yourself occupied. You can pick the pockets of patrolling guards or scavenge treasure from around the area, which you bring back to the team's safe house for you to sell on Thiefnet, and then you can use that money to buy power-ups for each member of the gang. There's so many great power-ups from a stealth slide for Sly, which can't be heard by guards and can whiz by them on some Tony Hawk shit, to an adrenaline burst for Bentley, which allows him to break into a lightning-fast sprint for a quick getaway, need some new material. I've used that gag like three times. To Atlas Strength for Murray, which allows him to sprint and jump while carrying objects and even enemies. Trust me, it's more useful than it sounds. But the power-ups don't stop there because clue bottles return and are scattered throughout the hubs at 30 a pop. A pop? Like a, you know, bottle? Because they're clue bottles. Bottle of soda. A pop? Huh? Eh? Huh? Eh? They're a brilliant way to encourage exploration and help you learn your way around each corner of every map. And your reward for finding all 30 Percocolas is a spicy new power-up, or in some instances, an old one from Sly 1. Lazy fox. There's the knockout dive and invisibility returning, but there's also new ones such as a voltage strike and spin which electrocute enemies, insanity strikes and rage bombs which turn guards from best buddies to illegal cage fighters, to a long toss which lets you throw stuff farther. Yeah, that one's not as cool. What is really cool is each episode is broken up into three acts. A reconnaissance stage where you go around snapping photos of the enemy operation to help formulate a plan to take the baddie down, then tackling a set of missions to put said plan into motion, and finally the episode climaxes with the big heist. And ben even puts on a cute little slideshow for you going over everything. How adorable. He's even got markers. All these changes made continue to feed into this massive shift in tone, which I love. You really feel like a conniving rat in this game from just about everything you do. From sneaking onto moving trains to steal clockwork parts to snagging radio tags from fucking bears. And even planting bugs, sometimes literally, in the main baddies headquarters to listen in on their conversations, which also just gives the world and its villains a little bit more spice. Ha ha ha, you'll get that joke soon. Even further encouraging encouraging stealth is the new health and combat system. No more lucky charm shit, that's for kids. That's the wrong cereal. The enemies are much tougher now, no longer being able to be taken down with a simple whack of your cane, especially not the flashlight guards. A toddler would have a better chance beating Brock Lesnar in a fair fight than you'd have against these fucking barbarians. To take these hulking beasts down, you'll need to surprise them from behind. What? 
Why? But as much as I adore the stealth heavy approach this game takes, you need to find a happy medium to avoid the experience becoming tedious. And what better happy medium is there than death and destruction? And who better to serve some of that up than the Murray? I mean, you can try sneaking with him anyway. Bless his heart, he's trying his best. As I alluded to earlier, Murray is now like the powerhouse of the group who just bulldozes his way through any obstacles thrown at him. There's not much to his gameplay, it's just beating people up, lifting things up, and putting them down. That's all he does, and that's all he needs to do. He's great. Except for throwing, he's pretty shit at that. Another great little touch I forgot to mention is when you kill an enemy sometimes, there will be like a pow sound, again, like a comic book, which I think is really cool. It's such a nice little touch. Don't make sense. Shut up. Bentley, on the other hand, is more methodical to play as. He's the most fragile of the three, so he has to rely on his gadgets such as sleep darts and bombs to help him get through life. Hacking missions even return to become a staple in this game. I think they overstay their welcome a little bit, but not enough to where it really hurts the game for me, so whatever. On top of those, there's even Bentley missions where you control an RC chopper, which controls a bit awkwardly at first, but you get the hang of it. And then there's of course Sly, who feels sneakier than ever because now he's learned to move without breaking into a sprint. He now prance around by default and can break into a run with R1. <laughs> not to mention he's back with the signature rail walk, slides, pipe climbing, and spire jumps whenever they want to actually fucking work. I love how each of the three members really have their own unique strengths and weaknesses, all of them serving a legit purpose now, making them feel like a true band of thieves. It's a shame that Bentley and Murray are pretty slow to maneuver around more vertical maps, but I'm just glad that they're useful at all now. But yeah, thanks to Neela's usefulness, we're off to thump the Claw Gang members one by one and steal their respective clockwork parts, starting with Dimitri, a rejected artist turned nightclub owner on the west side of Paris who's using the clockwork tail feathers as printing plates to produce counterfeit money. He also learned all his English from watching music videos, and that is fucking amazing. So after following the structure I explained earlier, it's time to head into the final stretch. The gang rips the nightclub sign from its moorings to send it crashing into the ground, where Sly can infiltrate Dimitri's sub-lab for a confrontation, and... wow. What a confrontation it is. What is this with clocks, bro? Have you no vision? Are you hearing what I mean to you? You think you have juice? Don't show me a little mind when talking about such big things. You think you can swing the bat? Show your bling and let me shine you. I have no idea what you're saying. And your suit sucks. As for the boss fight itself, it's pretty decent. You just gotta look out for Dimitri's beams and be ready to dodge a strike once you're up close. Once Dimitri's busted, we head off to India to take down Rajan, who's in possession of the clockwork wings. He was a poor lad growing up on the streets of Calcutta and began his life of crime selling illegal spices, which eventually brought him to present day where he's become the Claw Gang's lead spice manufacturer. After tricking Miss Carmelita into a dance with Sly, that gives the gang the distraction they need to steal the wings right out from Rajan's ballroom party. Humiliated, he retreats to literally the heart of his spice operation deep in the jungle where episode 3 takes place. Long story short, we destroy his spice operation in slow motion. Which brings him out of hiding, and Neela who's been helping us throughout the game so far by leading us to secret entrances for missions and even setting up the ballroom dance with Carmelita, betrays us, leading to Sly getting incapacitated and Murray having to step in to deal with Raja- Sly! Jesus Christ, Murray. On some real shit, I just love everything Murray does. I love this cutscene, it's so yummy. Who's the Murray? All I see is a fat, pathetic weakling. I might be big and not as smart as the other guys, but one thing I'm not is weak. Speaking of yummy, Rajan's fight is pretty solid. Rajan tries to strike you with his staff and can even electrify the water around you, which will fry you if you're not on a lily pad. He even sends his guards out to gang up on you, but of course it's nothing the Murray can't handle. After pounding some tiger ass, Sly, Murray, and even Carmelita are all arrested as she was framed by Neela for apparently being in league with the Cooper gang the whole time, which leaves Bentley by himself. <laughs> I've gone on about how much I love the way this game leads into the stealth side of things much more than the last, but my absolute favorite thing about Sly 2 is easily Bentley's character arc. Going back to Sly 1, he never left the van, and was even disgusted at the thought of stepping foot outside of it in the case of Haiti. Then he was terrified to be out on the field at all in the beginning of this game, but time after time his confidence has continued to swell with each passing job he's completed. And now this dude is slashing his way through the jungle all the way back to the team van, which he now learns to drive himself, and does a week of data crunching to find where his best friends have been imprisoned so he can free them. What. 
a beast. This leads to episode 4, Jailbreak where Bentley has to make his way to the Contessa's prison in Prague. The Contessa, who is a high-ranking member of Interpol but is also a secret member of the Claw Gang as their chief hypnotist, married a wealthy aristocrat who just so happened to die of poisoning a mere few weeks after their wedding ceremony. She then proceeded to open a rehabilitation center for criminals with her newly inherited estate, where she would supposedly relieve criminals of their bad vibes. But really, she was just hypnotizing them to tell her where they hid all their loot. After doing some eavesdropping on the eight-legged cow, hacking the train system to send it crashing through the prison walls, and disposing of the guards on duty along said prison walls, Sly is freed. The duo break into solitary confinement as Murray purposely got himself thrown in for the plan and, uh... <coughs> Well, he's on drugs. Who is that? Who, who, the Contessa's been using these hypno boxes to heighten the effects of illegal spice they've been feeding him, but after destroying the machines, he's back to normal, or at least as normal as Murray can be. Unfortunately, despite their pursuit, the Contessa escapes, but who gives a shit? This is adorable. They're laughing and smiling and eating hot dogs. They're so happy to be together again. So the Contessa is now hiding out at her castle estate and more importantly, is in possession of the clockwork eyes. With word getting out of her corrupt tactics, I mean, who knew a big ass spider wasn't all warm and fuzzy inside after all. Mila was granted a full scale army from Interpol as a means of taking her down. It turns out that Carmelita has been taken to the Contessa's re-education tower, ready to be brainwashed with the help of the clockwork eyes. Wow, DeviantArt must have had a field day with this. Eventually the gang frees Carmelita and she chases the Contessa. How did you miss that? Come then everything just breaks into complete chaos. Neela gets the clockwork eye, Bentley fucking dies, or somehow doesn't. What the hell? Carmelita took the other eye, and we gotta chase her down in the most awkward control vehicle I've ever used in my entire life, but by some miracle, we gun her down. The Contessa's ass is kicked quite easily twice. Oh god, more DeviantArt material! And yeah, that, uh got out of hand quickly, but that's yet another clockwork part for the Cooper gang. And now it's time for a literal cooldown period as the gang heads off for John Bisson in Canada. Bisson was a prospector during the gold rush who was frozen in an avalanche, but due to global warming, he thawed out, and now serves as spice distributor for the Claw Gang through his train system across North America. Personally, the Canada levels are my favorite. I love snowy settings, as I'm sure you guys know by now, and I think John Bisson's episodes are host to some of the most fun missions in the game, from tailing Carmelita to infiltrating Bisson's trains to stealing an eagle egg and more. I just think they're really fun. Bisson is in possession of the clockwork lungs and stomach. By the final heist, the gang had already swiped the lungs off two of his trains, but on the third train, Neela re-emerges attempting to snatch the clockwork stomach for herself, leading to a showdown with Bentley's RC chopper and what I found to be a moderately challenging battle. She sends out her own little biplanes and there's projectiles she fires at you which can be pretty tricky to evade at times. Because of constantly trying to avoid taking damage, it makes getting some shots of your own in harder, which I think is a a really neat little element to the fight. This was awesome! Definitely my favorite boss of the game! After doing away with her twice, the clockwork stomach I've is in our possession. Oh, hand, shut the fuck up, Slop! The lads notice some sketchy shit going on with the Northern Lights, so they decide to follow them, which leads to Bassan's lumber camp, where he is also in possession of the clockwork talons, where we get word of the final claw gang member, Arpeggio, allegedly making his way over to pick up the Northern Light battery. The only way the gang could possibly seize Arpeggio's clockwork brain is by sneaking onto his blimp, and the only foreseeable way to do that would be to drain the Northern Light battery of its power and stow away inside during the pickup. But before then, we of course have to retrieve the Clockwork Talons from Bassan, who decides to gamble them in his Lumberjack games. As you'd expect, the gang enters the competition and does whatever they can to make sure things go their way. But despite their best efforts to throw off Bassan, he unfortunately has the judges intimidated so that they'll always score his performances 7.8 out of 10 too much water. This leads to the gang having to improvise by leading the duck judges into a cave and stealing their clothes to disguise themselves so they can curb the scores. Wait, does this mean they ripped off their fucking beaks? Once again, this goes south for our boys, however, causing the three to be put out of commission by Bisson. And on top of that, Bisson even confiscates the clockwork parts they've collected and sells them all to Arpeggio, completely undermining everything the gang has done and gone through to make it this far. On the bright side, this leads to, in my opinion, a pretty neat fight. Bentley uses a walkie-talkie to communicate with Sly, who's inside the sawmill control room, to inform him of when to activate certain traps when Bisson is in the proper position. I don't I don't know, I thought that was pretty cool. The gang escapes and books it for the Northern Light Battery, and before they know it, they're up and away.
Oh, they lost the van too? Are you kidding me? The final chapter, episode eight, in my opinion, for the atmosphere alone, is great. It's just this chaotic whirlwind perfectly encapsulating the impending dread of clockwork being resurrected and how everything could go haywire any second now. Unfortunately for the Cooper gang, clockwork has already been fully reconstructed and Neil is here. Will you just die already? Here we get a lengthy exposition of, well, everything up to this point and why it all matters. Arpeggio's backstory is basically that he can't fly, so he wants to use Clockwork's body to be able to fly. Or at least that's what the cutscene about him would lead you to believe. But here he explains that immortality is what he seeks, and Clockwork's vessel is the perfect prop for eternal life. Basically, Arpeggio lets Sly retrieve all the Clockwork parts for him, and plans to unload a hypnotic light show of hate on the people of Paris from his blimp, using the power of the Northern Light batteries he's been collecting, along with legal spice produced by Rajan and distributed by John. <laughs> And said spice was laced in the food of many people at Dimitri's nightclub, and the spice is also susceptible to a hypnotic rage as proven by Murray. And apparently Clockwork has been immortal this whole time because of hatred. Uh, sure, we'll go with that. Definitely has nothing to do with the fact that he's a fucking robot. Then Neela double-crosses yet another person, yes, Arpeggio lasted that long in the story, and merges herself with Clockwork to become... Clockla? But why? Why would you do that? Why would you do any of that? Well, that happened. Let's kill it. The fight here is quite tedious in my opinion, just slow moving rockets and electric rings stand in your way, both of which are easy to take down. Once you bring Clockla's health down low enough, she storms off towards the safe house in a rage and rips it from the blimp and not before Murray gets one last pose in for those with the benefit of flash photography. With the blimp in shambles and Clockla out in the distance with our captive friends, it's just a very surreal climax just like the one I gave your mom. Soaring out into the void, you eventually make it to the bird and whack its head until it comes crashing down. Now it's time to pry open Clockla's mouth and destroy the hate chip, which is the source of her power. Okay, you're really losing me here. Bentley snags the hate chip and then let's get out of here she's about to explode okay as much as i think they stumbled a lot heading up to the finish line they miraculously stuck the landing this ending is fantastic carmelita smashes the hate chip and clockwork disintegrates right before their very eyes and a sly perfectly puts it how ironic that carmelita a police officer would be the one to lift the curse from the Cooper family. She places the gang under arrest, but Sly agrees to go peacefully so long as she lets his friends walk. And then something happens. The two begin talking like they're on a first date, finally getting the chance to really see each other's personal sides. And this is especially brilliant because they've had a sort of unlikely bond forming throughout the game. Well, with Sly setting her free from the Contessa, helping her escape from the cops thanks to Neela soiling her reputation, then once again working together to take down Clockwork. It's just ingenious storytelling. It's wonderful. And it looked like my pals had left me a little going away present before taking off. Floating away on the night breeze, I could faintly make out Carmelita's voice. I'll find you, Cooper! I'll be seeing you soon, Green Tail. I love this ending. And well... I love this game. I love how much more of a team the gang feels like here and love how their friendship feels much stronger than ever before. The refined art style is fantastic, the music is atmospheric, the game just feels more thievy which is exactly what I wanted from the mission structure to the operations, and even little additions like treasures and pickpocketing. The clue bottles are nicely repackaged, the hub worlds are a great change, the story is much more layered, and hey this game's funnier than the first too so that's a bonus. I should have figured a puny turtle like you would find a rat hole to squirm through. Well, I just dropped my glasses, had to come pick them up. On the flip side, as happy as I am that Bentley and Murray are much more useful this time around, as I said, they can be very tedious to venture through a couple of the hubs, unfortunately. Speaking of tedious, the missions also get a bit repetitive, like doing recon and pickpocketing over and over again. But they do a decent enough job making these missions feel distinct, and while a little more variety would be nice, obviously I don't find either of these problems massively damaging to the game at all. All things considered, Sly 2 is still still a fantastic game.
But seriously, the clockless thing sucked cockless. Oh shit, I have a bag of Milky Way. Ah! 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 Remember the game that gave us that gem? Me neither. <laughs> Booting up this game and just sitting right here on the home screen, ready to relive this horrific nightmare. I regret everything. Nearly 10 years ago, Amnesia The Dark Descent was released and it not only revolutionized the horror genre in gaming, but also took the internet by storm, arguably kickstarting careers out of YouTube for the likes of Pee Wee Didi and Captain Quark. If it weren't for Amnesia, I probably wouldn't be making videos today. It's been over 6 years since I downloaded OBS, hooked up my Turtle Beach headset, set up my shitty laptop webcam, and started my playthrough of Amnesia. Get used to seeing that turd, cause you'll be seeing more of him throughout this video. Say hello, younger me. Well, hello. There. Get the fuck out of my face right now before I strangle you with your own intestines. Tomorrow marks 10 years since Amnesia's debut, and more importantly, today is 21 years since I debuted on this planet, which is scarier to think about than Amnesia itself. With Amnesia Rebirth on the horizon, which you will not catch me playing because I'm an itty bitty pussy, let's remember together now what made Amnesia The Dark Descent such an unforgettably captivating, gut wrenching experience that maimed all the poor souls to have ever played it. Wait, there's a hard mode? <laughs> Fuck that! Amnesia follows the story of young Britishman Daniel, a man suffering from explosive diarrhea, obviously, who simply remembers his name, where he's from, and that he's scared of his own shadow. All alone, Daniel dazily stirs to his feet, immediately taking note of the pile of excrement he passed out in, and decides to follow its source. No music accompanying you, no friends, not even monsters. Just the subtle sounds of rain, the occasional crackle of thunder, and a creaking castle as you investigate your surroundings. Daniel eventually stumbles his way to a lantern and to an office space with a letter written by him to... himself. Where Daniel explains to himself that he has chosen to forget, but more importantly, lays out his objective. Go to the inner sanctum, find Alexander, and kill him. Furthermore, Daniel goes on to state that a relentless shadow is hunting him, and he must escape it for as long as he can. So we must now begin our descent beneath the very stone of the castle, avenge ourselves, and murder the dastardly Alexander of Brennenburg in the inner sanctum. Who's with me? <laughs> Fuck that, I'm out of here. That spongy gooey shit is the shadow manifesting itself as a pulsating organic residue that is painful to the t <laughs> This salmon semen demon is in hot pursuit of Daniel because he uncovered a mystical orb in a mysterious tomb while on an archaeological expedition to Algeria, and the shadow is a sort of supernatural guardian of this orb. To make a long story very short, after recovering this orb, its guardian starts killing everyone Daniel's come in contact with until Daniel receives a letter from Baron Alexander who's like, yo, crash in my crib, I can fix this, and Daniel was like, like, and I quote, hard bet. A lot of the story is obtained through notes, which isn't very interesting to show in a video sense because reading is boring and for geeks. Hey. But please take my word for it when I say that uncovering Daniel's backstory so far, as well as the lore of the world itself, has been incredibly fascinating. Not to mention the disturbing stories of the bad, bad man Alexander really is, and the torment he's inflicted upon others, which you'll learn a lot more about soon. Amnesia has also masterfully built up tension through unsettling ambience and atmosphere, equipped with fantastic sound design and an ominous soundtrack, all of which messing with the player's head and keeping them on the edge of their seat afraid to swing open any door in front of them in fear of what could be lurking behind. Combined with these presentation aspects, Amnesia introduces some ingenious gameplay mechanics, such as tinder boxes which light torches and a lantern which runs on oil. But the most infamous mechanic used in Amnesia is the sanity mechanic, which is literally game changing. Daniel's sanity can alter to four different levels. The more your sanity drops, the creepier and more unnerving your environment becomes, and you can even hallucinate monsters. Your sanity drops from looking at enemies, witnessing unsettling events, and most brilliantly and despicably, fuck you frictional game, staying in the dark for too long. If you stay in the dark for too long, the game punishes you. If you stay in the light for too long, the game punishes you. Amnesia presents a near constant, spine chilling, blood curdling sense of danger no matter where you go or what you do. I am literally trembling here and nothing is happening but I wanted to cry. My body right now is shaking. What a bitch. And this invisible water monster known as 
The Kank is easily the most frightening encounter of the game so far. Younger me, this is no time to be jerking off. Wherever you run off to, the monster will follow like a good pup, so you have to distract it by throwing body parts and books to allow yourself to escape using the various gates throughout the cellar. And when you're cranking this wheel with the monster quickly approaching, Jesus Christ, I can feel my spine shriveling into a raisin, which then leads into a lame old chase sequence. Like, come on, you're gonna have to do better than this, fellas. I've been chased by bears and- <laughs> you escape to the back hall of the castle and tranquility is restored. Oh great, now I'm scared and horny. There's three ways to go from here. The study, the guest room, and the storage, which is a big fat nope for now. So the study is where Alexander conducted experiments, and by experiments, I mean brutally torturing and killing dogs. In the hopes of extracting some sort of energy from them known as Vitae, which you'll learn the significance of later. As you wander around the study, you can even hear the echoes of dogs whimpering, and at one point you even vividly recall a flashback of Alexander conducting one of these heinous experiments, which is just more heartbreaking than words could do justice. And to make things worse, the torture of these poor animals was all for naught as Alexander found their Vitae output insufficient, which inspired him to move on to humans to get the energy he required. Dear fucking god, no, no. no! What we require at this moment is access to the elevator so we can venture further into the depths of Castle Brennan Bob's Burgers. So we retrieve a key from Daniel's old room for the machine room so we can go in and repair the darn thing, but not before being stopped dead in our tracks by a monster, where the game introduces the hiding mechanic, which will obviously come in very, very handy because, oh, that's right, you can't fight back against the monsters. You either hide, run, or die. Speaking of which, welcome to the storage. Oh, hell no. Fuck the storage. This place is consumed by a strange, unnatural darkness, and it is very scary not just cause of that, but because for most players, it will be your first true encounter with a monster besides the croc. All this terrible bull S word is endured just to get some rods to repair an elevator, and then the elevator does its best Tower of Terror impression and rockets downward at approximately 200 miles per hour. And this is where the flashbacks really hit me. Because this is where younger me was scarred forever. <laughs> no, 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 go away! Get away! Get away! <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> After re-experiencing this nightmare, I still believe the prison is easily the scariest part of the game. This place is Satan's fucking playground. There is virtually nowhere to hide, as you only navigate narrow hallways, with the occasional room to squirm into in case a monster threatens to rearrange your guts. You practically can't light anything because of course any torches you spark blow your cover as well as using your lantern, which isn't really a chance you can take in these slender corridors with the Antichrist spawning from thin air. You cannot stress enough how absolutely horrifying this dungeon is. So to be greeted with a nice open and oddly comforting entrance to the cistern upon your escape is a very welcome change of pace. The game here gives you a bit of time to breathe but of course always keeps you on your toes as you fix up some machinery in the control room and the cistern itself. And then it's time for, oh goody, the morgue. Ah yes, what could possibly go wrong in the morgue? How about a moose on the loose? This is where we are introduced to the second and final monster of the game game, the Brute. Unlike the Gatherers, which are slow and take a couple hits to kill you, the Brutes are... Fucking morons. The brutes are very fast, and if that wasn't bad enough, they can strike you down with a single blow. Also, I'm horny again. And I experienced the maliciousness of the moose firsthand in the sewers, which is the second scariest part of the game in my humble opinion. While the prison took all that tension building up through the whole game and threw it in your face with monsters galore, here psychology retakes a bulk of the spotlight. Hallucinating monsters, sound effects to make my skin crawl just hearing them. Walking into a room and seeing the monsters who've taunted you for so long sliced in half, Jesus Christ. And that's not even the worst of it, because at the end of the tunnels, you have to distract the Moose Man and run for your life. I hate this game! The sewer leads to what you could consider the final hub area of the game, the Nave. E. Not the Navy! 
<laughs> After taking a girthy spiral staircase, you meet Agrippa, who despite practically being a zombie, is the most comforting thing you come across the whole game because he's actually someone to talk to. It turns out he has quite a history with Alexander, as he explains Alexander broke his orb a long time ago when Alexander prematurely attempted to open the portal back to his home world. As Alexander currently has Daniel's orb in his possession, until we put Agrippa's back together, there is no chance of breaching the inner sanctum. So now we have to scout the choir and the transept for the six fragmented pieces of the orb, and both are quite nerve-wracking. Well, the transept is at least. The choir wasn't too crazy. There's my hot take for the day. While areas like the storage, prison, and sewer all provided great scares, the transept was easily the creepiest, eeriest, and thematically darkest out of all areas of the game. What separates the transept from all other sections is the fact that it is so rooted in reality. Well, except for the part where there's sunlight coming through windows. We should be like 2,000 feet below the Earth's surface right now. How are there windows and why am I questioning this sort of logic in a game about an interdimensional being trying to harness the power of a mythical ore? The transept is where much of the torturing by Alexander and Daniel took place. But why would Daniel torture people? Well, in fear that the shadow was closing in on them, Alexander tricked Daniel into torturing people the Baron claimed were criminals repeatedly with amnesia potions as sacrifices in an attempt to ward off the shadow. But really Alexander was just using Daniel to gather Vitae through torture to power Daniel's orb so Alexander could return to his homeworld from which he was banished hundreds of years ago for unknown reasons. These monsters you've seen are actually Alexander's servants and they gathered, hence their name, humans and threw them in the castle prison for Alexander to perform his experiments on. After running out of prisoners the duo kidnapped a mother and three children from a farm not far from the castle and one day one of the children they kidnapped escaped the prison. In fear that she would escape the castle, Daniel chased the little girl all the way up to the storage and murdered her in cold blood. He murdered an innocent child solely to protect himself. And this is the real Dark Descent. Amnesia is not just about evading monsters, it's about a desperate man becoming one as he plunges into darkness in the pursuit of salvation. The immeasurable guilt immediately flooded his body, shattering his psyche. Afraid that Daniel would soon turn on him, Alexander abandoned Daniel and locked himself in the orb chamber ready to begin the ritual which would send him home, leaving the shadow to consume Daniel. Enraged by Alexander deserting him, Daniel swore to kill Alexander for making him a monster. But as his heavy heart was too much to bear, he took an amnesia potion which they normally used on their torture victims victims and instead used it on himself. But before doing so, he left himself a letter to simply kill Alexander when he awakens in the hope of burying his past and redeeming himself once and for all. And that's what makes this the most unsettling section of the game for me. Amnesia the Dark Descent has interdimensional beings, artifacts, and worlds beyond our comprehension. Not to mention the monsters, while scathing, obviously couldn't happen in real life. Then again, 2020's been pretty fucking crazy, so who knows. But torture based off real methods, hearing these people beg for mercy, and the snapping and crackling of bones, the cutting of saws through flesh, and all the guilt Daniel caused himself by becoming someone he absolutely absolutely hates feels so real and that is really fucking terrifying and I wish I could say the same about the choir. Look, it's not that this place isn't creepy, all right? It's got all that torture shite and a gnarly jump scare, but what doesn't click with this place for me is how open it is. There wasn't anywhere you could step in the cellar without the water monster ripping into you. The prison made me incredibly claustrophobic with its tight hallways, making me feel suffocated. Then the sewer leaves you no choice but to face the monster and you just have to run for your life. But the choir? Sure, there's some monsters lurking about, but it's the size of a goddamn football field, and as long as you stay close to the walls and behind pillars, you're gonna have no trouble navigating it whatsoever. It just feels a couple steps down from where we've already been, you know? I mean, it literally is. After retrieving all the orb pieces, you get ambushed by some of Alexander's servants and thrown in a prison cell. Hey, Murray! Fancy seeing you here! Through telepathy, Alexander says that Daniel should stay in the cell and let the shadow claim him so that it may not devour the whole castle and his sacrifice may allow Alexander to return home safely. If you choose to do this, you'll actually activate an alternate ending to the game, and I almost unlocked it by complete accident because I'm a fucking moron! But of course, I defy Alexander and tell him to suck my interdimensional dog. And after getting chased by the shadow, we return to the nave and the shadow has completely trashed the joint. But before pressing on to the inner sanctum, we conjure up 
Johann Weyer's tonic. Weyer was Agrippa's apprentice who grew to far surpass his skills. Agrippa, Weyer, and Alexander were all working together to travel to Alexander's home world hundreds of years ago, but Weyer ended up being the first to open the portal and venture there. Alexander did not like this, so he put Agrippa's soul in this thing somehow. So Agrippa asked Daniel to make this tonic so that he could saw off Agrippa's head while keeping him alive and bring Agrippa with him to the inner sanctum so that he may enter the portal and reunite with his long lost apprentice. And we choose to do just that. We take Agrippa's head with us and with Agrippa's orb fully reconstructed, we finally breach the inner sanctum for the long awaited confrontation with the pasty old man as the ritual nears completion. From here there are actually three endings. The bad ending where you let Alexander escape and you just die. The revenge ending where you ruin the ritual by tipping over the pillars, Alexander is consumed by the shadow, and you leave Brennenberg knowing the man who made you a monster has been slain. And finally, the ending I chose, which is where you throw Agrippa's head into the portal to be reunited with his apprentice. This leaves both you and Alexander to be devoured by the shadow, however Agrippa pleads with Wire on the other side to spare Daniel's soul, as Agrippa commends Daniel for his noble sacrifice, saying he deserves so much more. And with that, the nightmare is finally over. And god damn it, I loved this nightmare. Despite my fascination with the lore of any horror stories I come across, horror games are in no way my thing to play if that wasn't obvious enough since I've covered nothing but kitty games. If it wasn't for 13 year old me sitting around watching PewDiePie play Amnesia, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. The dark descent into the Brennenberg castle wasn't only the conclusion to Daniel's journey, it was just the beginning of mine. Because of this game, it inspired me to make my own YouTube channel. And because of that, I've made some great friends over the years, formed wonderful memories, and along the way, we've built a nice little loving community here too. YouTube has become so ingrained with who I am that I don't feel like me anymore without it. And that was made very evident to myself when I stepped away from this for practically three years in 2016. Because you could call my return in 2019 my Rebirth. I am so passionate about doing this, and without amnesia, I may have never discovered this passion at all, or definitely not at least, you know, as early as I did. I would just like to take the time to thank all of you who have been watching me, some of you for years, you know, those who still support me, those who have just found me recently, uh, anyone who's just left a comment, a like, a dislike, you know, good comments, bad comments. They've all made me who I am today. They've all made me the content creator I am today. And last but not least, I would just like to give a big, big, big thank you to Frictional Games for creating such an unforgettable masterpiece. And with that said, and I mean this with the utmost respect and all the love in my heart, I am never playing this fucking game ever again.